My name is Killian, and this happened to me back in the fall of 96. I was a wilderness guide in the Rocky Mountains, Colorado backcountry, the kind that makes cities feel like a bad joke. Been doing this job since I was old enough to grow a beard and split firewood. Folks hire me to take them into the wild, keep them from getting lost or eaten, and most importantly, to find those moments of awe that only the mountains can give you. It was early season, a crisp morning with the first hints of snow frosting the peaks. My clients were a couple from the East Coast, suits and skyscrapers types, on a desperate bid for some of that rugged, outdoors magic. They were nice enough, but green as grass when it came to the backcountry. We reached a high meadow tucked away like a secret between towering cliffs. A perfect spot for lunch, so I thought. But as we unpacked the sandwiches, something shifted. The birds went quiet, the wind died down. That's when the smell hit me, rotting meat and wet fur, the kind that sends a shiver of primal fear down your spine. I scanned the treeline, rifle in hand. The clients had frozen mid-bite, staring with wide eyes. Then, movement on the edge of the clearing. It emerged from the shadows, a monstrous silhouette against the bright sky. This thing dwarfed any bear I'd ever seen, standing close to nine feet tall on its hind legs. Thick, dark fur rippled over bulging muscles. Its arms hung nearly to the ground ending in claws like butcher's hooks. The face, that's what stuck with me, a twisted mockery of a human face, all bared teeth and eyes that glowed with a chilling yellow light. An image straight out of a nightmare. We were outmatched, outgunned, and cornered. It let out a roar that shook the ground, a sound that wasn't bear, wasn't wolf, wasn't any animal I recognized. Run! I shouted at the clients, not sure if they understood, if their terror-frozen bodies could even obey. I turned, firing off a shot to distract the beast, more a desperate plea for the universe to intervene than any hope I could actually hurt it. The creature snarled, swiping a massive paw at me. I dove to the side, barely escaping its claws. The clients were moving now, stumbling through the meadow, heading for the tree line. The creature hesitated, calculating, then lunged after them. They had a head start, but they were slow, clumsy on the uneven ground. The thing was gaining, its strides eating up the distance. A hot surge of recklessness flooded through me. Yelling to draw its attention, I charged firing another shot that grazed the creature's shoulder. It spun, yellow eyes locking onto me. For one heart-stopping second, we stood there, predator and prey sizing each other up. I was no fool. I knew my rifle was a damn peacier against a creature like that, but maybe, maybe I could buy them a few more precious seconds to escape. The creature roared its defiance and charged. I ran, not towards any logical escape route, just away from the snapping jaws, the outstretched claws. Gunshots echoed behind me. The creature stumbled, letting out a howl of pain. I risked a glance back. The clients had reached the trees, the woman half dragging the man as they scrambled into the dense pines. A surge of hope flickered in my chest. Maybe, just maybe. Then the creature whirled, ignoring the fleeing couple, and fixed me with that burning gaze. I knew, deep in my gut, that it wasn't over. Not for me. Now, some folks might have played dead right then, or tried some negotiation with those begging eyes dogs do but I've lived by the mountains long enough to know some battles have to be fought, even if you know you'll lose. 
It's a matter of defiance, of facing the darkness and spitting in its eye. I raised my rifle one last time, aimed for the creature's monstrous head, and squeezed the trigger. The bullet found its mark, but the impact barely slowed it down. It charged, a relentless force of nature. The last thing I remember clearly is the impact, a brutal blow that shattered my rifle and sent me tumbling backward. Then the creature was upon me, its weight crushing the breath from my lungs, its fetid breath washing over my face. I thrashed, clawing at its fur, feeling my bones creak under its monstrous strength. Then, a blinding flash. A woman's scream cut through the air. The pressure on my chest vanished. I gasped, sucking in lungfuls of air mingled with the smell of burnt fur and gunpowder. I opened my eyes, squinting against the pain. The creature was writhing on the ground a few feet away. Smoke curled from its fur, the woman standing above it, the man's hunting rifle clutched in her shaking hands. Her first shot had gone wide, but the second, the second had struck the creature square in the eye. It howled, more in surprise than pain, thrashing with its remaining strength. The man, who I'd written off as a liability, was beside me, dragging me further away. I wanted to shout at them to run, to save themselves, but the words wouldn't form. The creature scrambled to its feet, its ruined eye a bloody mess. It let out one last earth-shaking roar, a mix of fury and frustration, then turned and bolted back towards the trees. It vanished into the shadows, leaving behind the acrid stench of smoke and an oppressive silence. It took hours to descend, to bandage my wounds and tend to the shell-shocked clients. We filed the official report, of course. Animal attack, bear or mountain lion, most likely rabid. The authorities raised some eyebrows, grumbled about inexperienced city folk, and eventually let it slide. Nobody believed us, but that wasn't the point. I never saw the creature again, but I feel it sometimes, just beyond the tree lane. There are nights when I wake up in a cold sweat, the smell of rotten meat clinging to my nightmares. Days when I find myself scanning the ridgeline, half expecting to see that hulking shape emerge from the pines. The clients went back east, their brush with the wild a horrifying story to tell at cocktail parties. Me, I stayed. Got myself some heavier firepower, started training tracking dogs specialized in unusual quarry. The wilderness has its secrets, its monsters that lurk in the forgotten corners. Someone's got to stay and watch, even if they just think I'm that crazy old mountain man muttering into his beard. The Rockies are still my home, but they don't feel quite the same anymore. There's a shadow cast over the pristine meadows and sparkling streams, a whisper in the wind of something older, darker, and far less forgiving than any natural predator I was trained to survive against. And I wonder, with a grim certainty, if it's only a matter of time before our paths cross again. That gnawing sense of unease intensified with each passing year. The mountains felt like a chessboard and I was just a pawn in a game I didn't fully understand. My dogs were my best defense. Bred and trained for the task, they sensed what I couldn't see, their hackles rising at empty swathes of forest, their whimpers echoing my own unspoken fears. Time blurred at the edges. Guide work became less about sharing the majesty of the wilderness more about vigilance and calculating escape routes. That nagging would have colored every rustle in the undergrowth, every pair of glowing eyes caught in my headlamp at night. Sleep came in restless snatches haunted by the feel of crushing weight and hot, fetid breath. Locals started giving me a wide berth. 
whispers swirled, old Killian's gone off the deep end, sees boogeymen round every bend. My reputation shredded, my guiding career fizzled out. Didn't much matter. I couldn't stomach taking some unsuspecting tourist into the crosshairs of the thing that had nearly ended me that day. Then came Sarah. Biologist, hired by the Parks Department to investigate an uptick in unusual large predator sightings. Spirited, with eager eyes unclouded by my haunted look, she saw not a crackpot, but a potential resource. I warned her off, told her tall tales and outright lies to scare her back to her cozy lap. She saw through the bluster, damn her. Saw the desperation underneath, and held her ground with stubborn determination. Against my better judgment, I agreed to take her out on an observation hike, armed with her fancy cameras and tracking equipment, and my battered old rifle. Days of trekking yielded nothing but aching muscles and Sarah's growing frustration. Yet, a grudging respect bloomed between us. She listened, truly listened, to descriptions of the creature that made seasoned rangers scoff. One evening, as we hunkered down by a campfire, the forest crackling with the hush just before snowfall, Sarah turned to me. Killian, she said, voice low, I believe you. And just like that, a dam burst within me. Years of silence, of shouldering the weight alone, washed away in a surge of ragged confession. I told her everything, the meadow, the clients, the creature's relentless gaze burning into my soul. When I finished, silence hung heavy in the air, broken only by the popping of the fire. Sarah sat there, face etched in grim contemplation. Then, she said, we have to prepare. If these creatures are multiplying. She didn't need to finish the thought. We started small. Reinforced my isolated cabin, laid in supplies, target practice until every shot became muscle memory. Sarah tapped into her network cautiously feeling out other researchers, a cryptic online community who shared sightings and theories whispered under the cover of internet anonymity. Turns out, I wasn't alone. Scattered reports surfaced from remote corners of the globe, describing creatures eerily similar to what haunted the Rockies. A pattern emerged, a terrifying, unbelievable one. Word reached me a year later, a mutilated elk carcass in a clearing high in the peaks, bearing the telltale signs of claws no bear possessed. Sarah was right. Their numbers were growing. When she arrived, there was a new glint in her eye, a mix of fear and iron resolve. That night, we hunched over maps spread on my threadbare rug, plotting known sighting locations. They're territorial, I muttered, tracing lines that were forming a dreadful pattern. Pushing outward, down from the highest peaks, maybe. Maybe they're running out of food, Sarah finished, her voice tight. Or outgrowing their territory. Either way, contact with humans is inevitable. It's already started. The room felt unnaturally cold. Outside, the wind howled, carrying on at the faintest whiff of that rotten, musky stink that made my blood run cold. This wasn't just about survival anymore, it was about a brewing war, humanity against an emerging predator straight from our oldest nightmares. The next few years were a blur of preparations and desperate pleas. We used my local reputation, the crazy mountain man tales to spread warnings disguised as outlandish fiction. Reinforced shelters, communication caches, evacuation routes quietly etched into the minds of mountain communities. We reached out to those cryptic online groups, forming a loose, wary coalition. 
It wasn't enough. Not nearly enough. News reports trickled in, then poured, missing hikers, hunters found savaged with a brutality no bear or wolf could inflict. The official explanations grew thinner, doubts flickered in the eyes of even the most skeptical rangers. Panic gnawed at isolated towns, and still, the wider world remained oblivious. Then it reached my doorstep. A frantic call on an old, crackling radio, a fire lookout spotted a pack of the creatures, at least four, moving down the valley. Heading straight for the nearest settlement, a sleepy ranching community unprepared for the horror descending upon them. Sarah and I exchanged a silent look. This was it. We gathered what weapons we could, herding my ever-faithful dogs into the battered truck. As we roared down the mountain road, I felt a grim echo of that first desperate charge, the one fueled by reckless defiance. Only this time, we weren't charging blind. This time, we had a sliver of a plan, a flicker of hope. The town was chaos when we arrived, hasty barricades, terrified faces, the stench of fear sharp in the air. We rallied whoever would listen, our ragtag crew armed with a hodgepodge of hunting rifles, antique shotguns, and more determination than sense. The creatures came at dusk, emerging from the shadows like figures from a nightmare made flesh. The battle was savage, brutal. Gunfire echoed through the valley, punctuated by the creatures' chilling howls. We fought tooth and nail, Sarah and I back to back, my dogs snarling and snapping at the monstrous forms. For every creature that fell, it seemed another took its place. And through it all, I saw him. The giant, the scarred one from the meadow, its eye a milky, ruined orb. It moved with a chilling intelligence, skirting the chaos, searching. It had found me. A surge of hot fury flooded my veins. It was me or them. Me, or this unsuspecting town reduced to bloody ruins. With a roar, I broke from the defensive line, charging towards the scarred creature. It let out a bellow, accepting the challenge. We met with the force of a natural disaster. Claws tore at my chest, teeth snapped inches from my throat. I grappled, shoved my rifle into its ribs, firing until the gun clicked empty. We crashed to the ground a tangle of limbs and hot, rage-filled breath. Then, a flash of movement, a weight slamming into the creature's side. My dogs. Loyal to the end. Teeth sank into its flesh, buying me precious seconds. Ignoring the burning pain in my ribs, I scrambled for my discarded knife and lunged. The fight ended in a bloody splatter my knife buried to the hilt in the creature's heart. Silence descended, broken by ragged gasps and whimpers, our own and the dying creatures strewn across the trampled ground. We won the battle, bought the town a fragile reprieve. The aftermath was a desolate scene, bloodied bodies, shattered lives, and the lingering taint of fear staining the mountain air. We patched up the wounded, buried the dead, human and monster alike. And I knew, with bone-deep certainty, that it wasn't over. Not by a long shot. This was just the beginning. My name's Everett Landry. This happened to me back in the summer of 93. I've been a forest ranger in the Cascades, Washington State, for most of my life. This ain't your cushy park job, it's wild backcountry. Miles of dense forest, mountains that'll eat you alive if you ain't respectful. Summer patrols are usually routine, 
checking permits, clearing fallen trees, the occasional lost hiker. But this one morning felt different. The air hung heavy, the usual birdsong absent. Even the bugs seemed to have vanished. An oppressive silence settled over the forest, making my skin crawl. Following a narrow deer trail, I came upon a site that made my blood freeze, an abandoned campsite. But this wasn't a hiker's site. The tent was ripped to shreds, gear scattered like a whirlwind had blown through it. In the center of the chaos lay a heavy-duty hunting rifle, still loaded, just abandoned. And then I saw the prince. I've tracked my share of bear, cougar, you name it. These footprints were huge, two-toed, claws digging deep into the earth. Whatever made those tracks was bigger and stronger than any predator I could name. And then the smell hit me, musky, rotten, the kind that sends shivers of primal fear down your spine. Knowing I was outmatched, I radioed for backup. My voice shook as I described the scene, even with my years of training. My supervisor, Old Man Cooper, sounded grim but told me to stay put. Help was being assembled, but it would take a while. Those next few hours waiting alone were the longest of my life. Every rustle, every snap of a twig, sent my heart pounding. Then, as the afternoon sun filtered through the trees, I saw movement. A hulking shape stepped out from the shadows. It stood at a good eight feet tall, covered in shaggy, brown fur. Massive shoulders led down to monstrous hands that dragged along the ground. The face was the stuff of nightmares, a twisted, vaguely human mask with a wide, jagged-toothed mouth pulled back in a snarl, and burning yellow eyes. This was no bear, no mutated beast. This was something else. It tilted its head, studying me with a chilling intelligence. In that moment, I understood the true fear of prey sensing its predator. There was no escape. Then it charged. I sprinted through the trees, boots scrambling for purchase on the mossy ground. The thing crashed through the undergrowth behind me, its roars echoing through the forest. I burst onto an old logging road, just as a battered park truck screeched to a halt. Cooper was at the wheel, along with two other rangers. They had rifles out, faces pale but determined. As the creature lunged out of the forest, they opened fire. Shots rang out, and the thing stumbled, letting out a roar that shook the air. For one hopeful moment, I thought we might drive it off. But it didn't retreat. Enraged, it charged the truck. It reached the hood in a few monstrous bounds, its claws raking across the metal. The truck lurched and heaved under the onslaught. Cooper yelled for us to retreat as he tried to throw the vehicle into reverse. That's when I saw Terry, the youngest ranger, frozen in terror outside the passenger door. The creature swiped at him with a paw the size of a dinner plate. He screamed, falling backward, blood spraying across the windshield. Something inside me snapped. I lunged back towards the truck, snatching up the abandoned hunting rifle lying in the dirt. I ignored the chaos, Cooper yelling, the truck bucking wildly, the creature's roars, and sighted down the barrel. My first shot caught the thing in the shoulder, making it stagger. I fired again, hitting it square in the chest. It roared in pain but kept coming. I fired a third time. The shot echoed, and then, silence. The creature swayed, its eyes wide with confusion. Blood pulsed from its wounds. With a shuddering breath, it collapsed, the ground trembling beneath its massive weight. 
I stood over its body, rifle still raised, chest heaving. We had won this battle, but a cold fear was settling in. How many more were out there? Cooper and I hauled Terry's lifeless form into the truck, his blood soaking my hands. The remaining ranger was on the radio, calling for urgent medical evac, his voice choked. As he spoke, I stared at the dead creature, at the eerily familiar shape of its face, and a wave of nausea washed over me. They choppered Terry out, but it was too late. We never found his body. Officially, it was ruled a cougar attack, an unfortunate accident. Only the four of us on that logging road knew the truth, a truth we swore to take to our graves. Cooper retired soon after. He couldn't stomach seeing the forest the same way again. The other ranger quit, left the state entirely. Me, I stayed. I wasn't going to let some monster drive me from these woods. But I patrol differently now. Always armed, always watching the tree line, always waiting for those yellow eyes to emerge from the shadows. Years have passed. Sometimes I think I see movement out of the corner of my eye, a hulking silhouette slipping through the trees. I'll find tracks that send a chill down my spine, or come across an abandoned campsite with that same, terrifying, musky smell clinging to the air. The Park Service calls them animal attacks, unexplained disappearances. I know better. The Cascades are vast and untamed, their depths holding secrets older than the logging roads and ranger patrols. There are things lurking in those shadows, things that defy classification. And out there, in the quiet of the deep woods, I sometimes wonder, if I stumble upon one of those creatures again, will I be the hunter, or the hunted? That chilling question followed me as the years turned into decades. I grew hardened, wood smoke and worry lines etched into my face. The other rangers started calling me Old Man Landry, half-joking, half-respectful of my time spent guarding those wilds. I never married, never started a family of my own. Somehow, it felt reckless knowing the danger that lurked just beyond those trails. The other rangers, they came and went. Greenhorns with eager eyes that slowly dimmed as they glimpsed the deeper darkness behind the postcard views. Most didn't last. The ones who did, the ones who became my reluctant brothers-in-arms, they learned the silent code, watch your back, trust your instincts and always carry more ammo than you think you'll need. Then came Riley, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and full of textbook wilderness knowledge. Reminded me of myself, back when I was still naive enough to think these woods could be fully understood. That first summer, I took him under my wing, shared hard-earned tricks of the trade. But there was some things a textbook couldn't teach. Shadows a classroom couldn't prepare you for. It happened on a blisteringly hot day in July, a patrol through a notoriously dense section of old-growth forest. The kind of place where sunlight barely penetrates, and the silence feels, expectant. We were nearing the end of our route when Riley tripped on an exposed root, tumbling forward with a startled yell. I whirled, rifle at the ready, and saw them emerge from the shadows. Not one creature this time, but three. The one in the lead was enormous, even bigger than the brood I'd faced years ago. Its eyes burned like embers, its scarred hide rippled with unnatural muscle. The two flanking it were smaller, but no less formidable. They moved with a chilling, coordinated intelligence. Riley, slowly, back toward me, I ordered, my voice hoarse. But Riley was frozen, staring at the creatures with a mix of terror and awe. 
the lead creature tilted its head, a grotesque parody of curiosity. Then it snarled and charged. I fired, emptying the rifle in a desperate attempt to slow them down. Two of the creatures stumbled, roars of fury cutting the air. The third, the largest, kept barreling forward. It slammed into me, knocking the breath from my lungs. I went down hard, the world spinning. Pain exploded in my leg. One massive claw had raked across my thigh, tearing muscle and sinew. I screamed, thrashing blindly. The creature was upon me again, its fetid breath washing over my face, its teeth inches from my throat. And then a gunshot thundered in my ears. The creature jerked, a dark hole blooming in its forehead. It slumped to the ground, its dead eyes staring sightlessly at me. Riley stood there, breathing raggedly, his youthful face etched with a horror that would never fully fade. He just saved my life. Medics airlifted me out. Months of grueling rehab followed. The leg healed, but with a limp, a constant reminder of that day in the old growth. And deeper than the physical scars, something inside me had changed. I had stared into the abyss, and it had stared back. I couldn't unsee those eyes. Couldn't shake the feeling that we were fighting a losing battle. When I finally returned to the Cascades, it was to a desk job at headquarters. They offered me a full retirement, said I'd earned it. Some part of me knew they were right. But a stubbornness clawed at my gut. I wasn't done. Not yet. I started compiling a file. Every whisper of strange sightings, every vanished hiker, every unexplained animal attack that felt off. Over the years, the file grew into a monstrous testament to the shadows lurking in our woods. Patterns emerged, rough territories, probable migration routes for the creatures. I shared my findings with a select few, trustworthy rangers I trained myself. We started planning. Not offensive patrols, we weren't fools enough to start a war. But preventative measures, warning signs on remote trails, emergency beacons, targeted surveillance. Every missing person prevented, every life saved felt like a small victory against the encroaching darkness. The other rangers started whispering behind my back. Old man Landry's gone crazy, they'd say with nervous laughter. I let them talk. It was better than them knowing the truth, bearing that soul-crushing weight. Then came the night the radio crackled with a panicked voice, Riley. He was on a routine patrol in a section of the park not known for trouble. His voice shook badly as he described movement in the trees, a familiar, musky smell, and eyes, those damn, burning eyes, reflecting in his flashlight beam. Then, the connection cut out. I assembled a team faster than ever before. We roared into the night, the headlights cutting a path through the inky blackness. We found Riley's jeep overturned in a ditch. No sign of him, no body just a lingering fear hanging in the air. We searched for days, then weeks. Nothing. Riley vanished just like the others, another name added to the ever-growing file, another pair of eyes extinguished. That's when I knew it was time. I packed my bags and left the Cascades under cover of darkness. Drove south, then east with no real destination in mind. I found a remote cabin nestled on the edge of another sprawling forest, this time in the Appalachians. Word gets around our circles, and they knew who I was, what I'd seen. So now, I wait. I maintain the cabin, 
patrol the woods and keep adding to my gruesome file. Because those creatures, whatever they are, they aren't confined to a single mountain range. They're out there, multiplying, lurking in the forgotten corners of the wild. And somehow, I know they're searching for me. Some nights, I think I hear a twig snap outside my window. Other nights, the silence feels too heavy, like something monstrous is holding its breath. I keep my rifle loaded, a hone hunting knife by my bedside. I'm not going down without one hell of a fight. My final stand is coming. I can feel it in my bones. And maybe, just maybe, the file I leave behind will be the start of something bigger. A flicker of hope in the fight against the shadows, a warning whispered through generations of rangers yet to come. My name is Killian Forrester, and this happened to me in October of 1997. I've lived out in the woods most of my life. It's my preferred way of existing, quiet, peaceful. Gives me time to work, to think, to just be. I spend my days as a wildlife tracker in the dense forests of the Olympic National Park, tucked away in the northwest corner of Washington State. It's rugged territory, the kind that can swallow you whole if you're not careful. One brisk autumn morning, I set off deeper into the woods than usual. A series of cougar sightings had been reported, and it was my job to investigate. Now, I'm used to tracking big cats, but these reports, there was something different, an edge of uneasiness to them. Hours into my hike, the forest floor changed. The moss-laden ground gave way to a strange, muddy clearing. Footprints littered the area, huge misshapen things far too large to belong to any animal I recognized. My heart pounded in my chest, a mix of professional curiosity and a primal instinct screaming at me to run. Something shifted in the shadows. A low, guttural growl made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. At the edge of the clearing, a figure emerged from the dense undergrowth. It was massive, easily eight feet tall, hunched over on powerful limbs. Thick, matted fur covered its body, a dark, oily brown in the dappled sunlight. Its face, it was like something out of a nightmare. Humanoid, yet distorted. Elongated jaw, teeth like jagged shards, and eyes that glowed an unnatural, unsettling yellow. For a heartbeat, time seemed to freeze. We just stared at each other, this creature and I. An outsider and a thing that shouldn't exist. Then, with a deafening roar that shook the trees, it charged. I stumbled back, fumbling for my rifle. The creature was fast, impossibly so. I fired off several shots the noise echoing through the trees. One seemed to connect, as the creature snarled and stumbled slightly, but it wasn't enough to stop it. I turned and ran, my lungs burning with the effort. The monster crashed through the undergrowth behind me, its roars echoing in my ears. I pushed through the dense foliage, branches whipping at my face, my heart hammering against my ribs. The forest was a blur of green and brown, but I had a rough sense of direction. I was heading towards an old logging trail, my only chance of escape. My foot caught on a root, and I went sprawling. Pain exploded in my ankle, but I didn't have time to assess the damage. Scrambling to my feet, I limped onwards, adrenaline masking the worst of the pain. The creature was closing in, its heavy footfalls shaking the ground. I burst onto the logging trail and started running, praying my injured ankle would hold out. The gravel crunched underfoot, 
each step a jolt of agony. Behind me, the creature's roars grew closer, filled with rage and a bloodthirsty hunger. My vision blurred, sweat stinging my eyes. Every breath was a battle. I was losing ground, the creature's monstrous form gaining on me with each passing step. Just when I thought I couldn't go any further, I saw a break in the trees ahead. A dirt road, my salvation. If I could reach it. I pushed myself with every ounce of strength I had left, fueled by a desperate, primal fear. With a final burst of speed, I stumbled onto the road, just as the creature broke through the tree lean. It roared in frustration, its eyes burning with fury. For a terrifying moment, we locked eyes, separated by only a few yards. Then, with a last, defiant snarl, it turned and vanished back into the woods. I stood there, gasping for air, my body trembling. I didn't dare move, just in case the creature changed its mind. Minutes passed in a daze of shock and disbelief. Finally, gathering what little strength remained, I began to limp down the road. It took hours, but I eventually made it back to civilization, shaken to my core. The authorities searched the area. They found no trace of the creature, only my story and a set of bizarre footprints that no one could identify. I was labeled a kook, or worse, a liar. But I know what I saw. I know I'm lucky to be alive. The Olympic National Park remains a wild, untamed place, filled with mysteries and the echoes of things the human mind struggles to comprehend. I returned there for work, but I never went back to that clearing. Some things, it's better they stay undisturbed. And sometimes, the most terrifying things in the forest aren't the ones we can explain. Days turned into weeks, and still, the nightmares stalked me. The creature's form, its guttural roars, its inhuman eyes, all burned into my memory. I tried to convince myself it was just a bear, a one, perhaps. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. There was an intelligence behind those glowing eyes, a malevolence that chilled me to the bone. My colleagues began to distance themselves, whispered rumors casting me as an unstable fabulist. The isolation only amplified the gnawing fear that clung to me. I started to hear things at the edge of my property, rustling in the undergrowth, those same blood-curdling roars drifting through the night. Was it my mind playing tricks, or was the creature out there, waiting? The breaking point came one stormy night. I woke to a sound like thunder, only to find my cabin shaking violently. Something was outside, something big and powerful. I huddled in the darkness, my rifle clutched tightly in sweating hands. Then came the scratching, a horrific clawing against the wooden walls. That guttural snarl rose above the howling wind, a promise of violence. I couldn't stay there any longer. I fled into the night, the storm raging around me. The rain lashed my face, but I barely felt it. My mind was consumed by a single, desperate thought, escape. I ran for what felt like hours, my injured ankle screaming in protest. Every shadow seemed to conceal the lurking form of the beast. The forest became a labyrinth of terror, the relentless rain blurring my surroundings. Exhaustion threatened to take me, but fear drove me onward. Then, up ahead, a flicker of light. A house, a flicker of hope against the darkness. I stumbled towards the light, driven by sheer desperation. Bursting through the front door, I slammed it shut behind me, my ragged breaths echoing in the sudden silence. 
An elderly couple stared at me in shock and confusion. Words stumbled out, broken and incoherent. I tried to explain about the creature, the danger, barely finding the air to speak. The old man, Gerald, his face weathered and etched with a lifetime of hard work, looked at me with a mixture of concern and disbelief. His wife, Eleanor, her eyes wide with fear, hurried to get me a towel and a steaming mug of something that smelled faintly of chamomile. They ushered me into their living room, a cozy place filled with warmth and the comforting scent of old books. I recounted my story, the terror in my voice still raw. Gerald listened quietly, his brow furrowing as I described the creature. Eleanor clutched my hand, her touch surprisingly firm. When I finished, there was a heavy silence. Then, Gerald cleared his throat. Son, he said, his voice thick with a strange, local accent, these woods hold things folks don't talk about much. Old stories, whispers handed down. Now, what you describe, it ain't natural. Sounds like you ran into a Sasquatch. The word hung in the air. Sasquatch. Bigfoot. Myth, legend, dismissed as the stuff of campfire tales. Yet, my gut clenched with a terrifying certainty. It all fit the footprints, the strength, the aggression. They ain't usually so, forward, Eleanor said a tremble in her voice. But things change. Forests shrink, animals get desperate. My mind raced. If this was indeed a Sasquatch, what had driven it to such brazen behavior? Was this an isolated incident or a sign of a bigger change, a dangerous shift in the fragile balance of the wilderness? Gerald refilled my mug his hands moving steadily. Now, he said, we ain't got much, but you're safe here. Rest up. Tomorrow, we'll figure out what to do. Exhaustion washed over me. I fell asleep in a worn armchair, my dreams haunted by monstrous forms and those glowing, yellow eyes. The next morning, rain still hammered against the roof but the storm within me seemed to have calmed slightly. Gerald was up early, moving around with surprising agility for a man his age. The smell of frying bacon filled the air, a tantalizingly normal scent in this world gone mad. We ate breakfast in silence, the unspoken question hanging between us, What now? I couldn't go back, not alone. And what about the creature? Was it still out there, a lurking threat in the storm-soaked woods? After we finished, Gerald stood, his gaze steady. There's a ranger station some miles from here. They'll listen, even if they don't believe. I'll take you. Hope flickered anew. Perhaps this was the turning point. Maybe, together... We could warn people, get help, contain the threat. We set out mid-morning, the rain tapering off. Gerald navigated the muddy tracks with the ease of someone who knew every inch of this territory. The forest seemed different now, less welcoming, every rustle and shadow a potential threat. Hours passed as we drove through the dripping trees. My ankle throbbed but I ignored it. We weren't out of danger yet, not by a long shot. Then, as we rounded a bend, Gerald slammed on the brakes. His eyes were wide, staring at something in the road ahead. My heart hammered against my ribs. A tree lay across the path, huge and freshly uprooted, blocking our way. Dread settled in my stomach. The creature. This wasn't a coincidence. This was an ambush. Gerald swore under his breath. We need to go back, find another route. 
he started to reverse the truck, but a deafening roar ripped through the air. The earth trembled, and the creature emerged from the trees. It was bigger than I remembered, its fur matted with rainwater, its eyes blazing with fury. It took one powerful leap and landed on the hood of the truck. Glass shattered, metal screeched. Gerald screamed as the creature raked its claws through the windshield, the razor-sharp nails narrowly missing his face. The truck jolted as the creature rocked it back and forth, its weight crushing the metal. I fumbled with the door handle, panic surging through me. The creature let out another roar and lunged at me, its teeth gnashing inches from my face. I scrambled out just as the truck crumpled, Gerald still trapped inside. I ran, heart pounding, the creature's roars and the sound of tearing metal fading behind me. I didn't look back. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs gave out, collapsing onto the rain-soaked ground. I lay there gasping, the world spinning. Gerald was gone. His sacrifice had given me these precious moments of escape, but for how long? The creature would track me. It was relentless, intelligent. There was nowhere to hide, no one to turn to. The forest, once my sanctuary, was now a prison. Ahead lay only death or a fate perhaps even worse. Hours later, I stumbled upon a highway. Hitchhiked, told a story of a car accident and a lost friend, my voice hoarse. I made it to Seattle and vanished into the anonymity of the city. Every day, I look over my shoulder, waiting for those yellow eyes to appear in the crowd. Every night, the nightmares return. The Olympic National Park is still there, vast and untamed. People still vanish from those woods every year, disappearances dismissed as tragic accidents, the victims lost to the unforgiving wilderness. But I know the truth. Something monstrous lurks out there, a darkness hidden in the shadows of the trees. My name's Ezekiel Landry, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2002. Been a hunter, tracker, and woodsman all my life. These mountains are in my blood, the Ozarks. Tough country, beautiful if you know where to look. Keeps most folks out, which is how I like it. Now, something ain't right in these woods. Been this way for a while. The game's gone skittish, their usual trails shifted. Birds sound off-key, like they don't quite recognize their own calls. It sets my teeth on edge, this uneasy feeling, like the forest itself has shifted on its foundations. This particular afternoon, I was tracking a deer. I was high up on a ridge, wind whipping at my face. I came across a clearing I never noticed before. Something about that empty space sent a chill through me. Not a natural empty. That's when I saw the campsite. Looked like it had been torn apart, shredded tent flapping in the breeze, food containers ripped open, gear strewn about. No sign of whoever stayed there. But those weren't animal tracks in the mud. Not any animal I recognize. The prints were huge, two-toed, claws sunk deep into the earth. The air got thick then. No birdsong, the wind died down, the whole world holding its breath. That's when I smelled it, that musky, greasy stink that makes the hair on the back of your neck rise. He was close. I turned slow, rifle at the ready. Then I saw him, stepping out from the tree lean. He was massive, a good seven, maybe eight feet tall. Covered in thick, dark fur, with arms long enough to drag on the ground. 
the face, it almost looked human, twisted into this monstrous mask. Beady black eyes, a snout split into a feral grin that showed way too many teeth. This wasn't a bear, not an ape. Never seen anything like it. Whatever it was, it wasn't natural. We locked eyes, hunter and hunted. Instinct screamed at me to run, but something froze me in place. We stood like that for an eternity, neither of us moving. Then, he tilted his head, like a damn dog trying to understand what it's seeing. He took a step forward, and that's when I snapped out of it. I fired, two echoing booms breaking the silence. One of the shots must have hit. He reared back, letting out a roar that shook the trees. He didn't go down, though. He charged, barreling through the underbrush like it wasn't even there. I fired two more shots, desperation making my hands shake. He stumbled, then kept coming, closing the distance with impossible speed. That's when I turned and ran. The forest was a blur of browns and greens. I scrambled down the ridge, the creature's enraged bellows echoing behind me. I could hear it crashing through the trees, gaining fast. I stumbled, fell hard, twisting my ankle. Searing pain shot through my leg, but I forced myself up, lurching onward. Up ahead, a flicker of hope, an old logging road. If I could reach it. My foot caught on a root, and I went down again, my rifle skittering away. Scrambling to my knees, I looked up just as the creature broke through the foliage. It towered over me, its breath hot and stinking on my face. I braced myself, a scream locked in my throat. Then, a gunshot rang out. The creature jerked, its eyes widening in surprise. A small, dark hole appeared in its forehead, right between its eyes. It let out a choked gurgle, swayed on its feet, then collapsed with a ground-shaking thud. I lay there, shaking, unable to process what just happened. Slowly, cautiously, I looked towards the source of the shot. A man emerged from the trees, an older guy with a salt and pepper beard and eyes as sharp as a hawk's. He held a hunting rifle, smoke curling from the barrel. Name's Corbin, he said, voice gruff but steady. Reckon you just met the local boogeyman. Corbin didn't talk much, even after he helped me back to his cabin and patched my ankle. But from the few things he did say, I pieced together a chilling story. This, thing, had been around these woods for years. Locals whispered tales of a wild man, cattle mysteriously slaughtered, hunters gone missing. Corbin, ex-military with a shadowed past, was one of the few who believed and watched. Now, here we were, staring at the creature's corpse. It felt surreal like a nightmare made flesh. Corbin took some measurements, muttering to himself. You ever report this, he said, looking up at me, they'll lock you up. Best keep it between us, understand? I nodded. What else could I do? We hauled the carcass deeper into the woods, concealed it as best we could, then swore each other to secrecy. We parted ways, and I never saw Corbin again. Weeks later, I still woke up in a cold sweat, the creatures in human eyes haunting my dreams. It felt like that encounter tainted the woods, something lurking out there that the rational mind couldn't grasp. Fear gnawed at me. When the leaves started to turn, I packed my things and left the Ozarks. Didn't look back. Some reckon I was a fool for running, that a true woodsman would have stayed, hunted the thing down. Maybe they're right. But sometimes, 
There are things better left unknown, shadows best left unchallenged. I drive a truck now, cross-country halls. See some sights. Sometimes I pass through forests at night, dense and dark, and the smell of damp earth brings it all back. I catch a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye, and my heart pounds in my chest. I tell myself it's nothing, just a deer, a trick of the headlights. But deep down, I know better. The world's a big, strange place. There are stretches of wilderness left where the old rules don't apply, where things we think impossible claw their way into existence. Most folks are lucky enough to walk their whole lives without seeing that side of things. Now, I've seen it. There's no going back. That uneasy dread clung to me even as I tried to build a new life. Driving me endless highways, I'd find my eyes scanning the tree lean, waiting for a monstrous shape to emerge. Every rustle in the bushes sent me jolting, hand reaching for a gun that wasn't there anymore. Couldn't escape the nightmares either. I'd see the clearing, the shredded tent, feel the creature's hot, fetid breath on my face, and wake up gasping, soaked in sweat. They'd leave me trembling in the dark, snatching at remnants of sleep with my heart pounding in my ears. It ate at me, that relentless fear, and the guilt of leaving Corbin to deal with the aftermath alone. What if there were more things like it out there? What if he needed help? After a particularly bad night, something in me snapped. I turned my truck around and headed straight back towards the Ozarks. Found Corbin's cabin just as I remembered it, nestled at the edge of the forest. He seemed different, older, harder. The years hadn't been kind. You shouldn't have come back, boy, Corbin said gruffly when he saw me. I told him I couldn't stay away, that I needed to face the thing, help somehow. He just grunted and shook his head, his eyes shadowed. Finally, he relented. It got worse, he said as we poured bitter coffee. He told me of other disappearances in the months since I left. Hunters, a lone hiker, even a kid who strayed too far from town. Gone, vanished without a trace. No bodies, just whispers of sightings, a hulking form in the twilight, those malevolent black eyes, and that lingering, rancid smell. Corbin had become the reluctant protector of these woods. He tracked the creature, learned its patterns, left warnings at trailheads. He turned his cabin into an arsenal, traps motion cameras, enough firepower to start a small war. It was a lonely, dangerous battle, and he was losing. The next few days were filled with tense preparations. We set new traps, reinforced the cabin, and drilled until muscle memory took over. The creature seemed to sense our determination. I saw it several times, a hulking shadow on the edge of the clearing, its eyes burning through the darkness. The waiting was the worst part, the gnawing fear coiling tighter with each passing hour. Then, one night, it came. The woods erupted with a chorus of howls so chilling they caught right through me. The creature was close, and it wasn't alone. We took up our positions, guns loaded, eyes scanning the darkness. Corbin by the window, me hunched by the door. Through the trees, I saw them. Not one monster, but three. Same monstrous form, yet something off-kilter about their movements, less controlled. Offspring, Corbin muttered, his face grim. One of the creatures lunged, slamming against the cabin wall wood splintered, and I fired, the sound deafening in the small space. 
We fought back, firing as fast as we could reload. The creatures howled in rage and frustration, the stench of them overwhelming. Then, as quickly as it started, they were gone, their forms receding into the shadows. We held our breath, listening to the fading sounds of their retreat. The cabin looked like a war zone, shattered glass, holes peppering the walls, and the lingering stink of something savagely wild. We slumped onto the worn couch, exhausted, wounded, but alive. It was a victory, but a bitter one. There were more of them now, and they were learning, adapting. We couldn't keep this up forever. Morning came, harsh light illuminating the scene of destruction. We surveyed the damage, a silent understanding in our eyes. It was time to escalate. If the fight came to us, we'd take it to them. Days turned into a blur of grim preparation. Corbin showed me hidden trails known only to seasoned hunters like himself, passages that wound deep into the heart of the forest. He taught me how to mask my scent, move soundlessly. We laid careful plans, bait, ambush sites, escape routes plotted not for survival, but for extermination. The hunt started at dusk. With every step deeper into the woods, my dread ratcheted higher. The forest felt oppressive, closing in around us. This was their territory, and we were intruders. We found their den hidden within a network of caves, the ground littered with bones, both animal and chillingly human. The rancid musk was strong here, nauseating. We set the bait, a freshly killed deer laced with enough tranquilizers to knock out an elephant. Then we retreated to our predetermined positions and waited. Hours stretched into a tense eternity. The forest rustled and whispered, every creak and crackle setting my nerves on edge. Just as doubt started to creep in, they appeared. All three of them, slinking from the cave with unnatural grace. The first creature launched for the bait, tearing into the carcass. Corbin gave the signal. We opened fire. The creatures roared in surprise, thrashing in their drug-induced haze. We kept firing, reloading, firing until their movements slowed, their roars gurgled into choked moans. We approached cautiously, weapons still raised. Two were down, unmoving. The third was still twitching, trying to fight the sedation. Corbin stepped forward and delivered a mercy shot. Silence descended, broken only by our ragged breaths. It's over, Corbin said but his voice lacked conviction. Something was wrong. The dread that had been my constant companion intensified, twisting my gut with icy fingers. And then I understood. The cave's entrance gaped in the darkness behind the slain beasts. We weren't alone in there. The world exploded into chaos. A roar ripped through the cave, a sound of unbridled fury that chilled me to the bone. From the shadows erupted a massive form, larger than any of the others. Its eyes blazed with a terrible intelligence, a raw hatred. This was the Alpha, the true parent of this monstrous brood. It charged. My name is Killian Beck and this happened to me back in the fall of 2008. I'm a wildlife biologist working up in Alaska, mostly on the Kenai Peninsula. It's beautiful yet rugged terrain, with dense spruce forests, snow-capped mountains, and glacier-fed rivers. Deep in the woods, I came across a campsite that had seen better days. The tent was a shredded mess. Clothes and supplies were strewn about, and there was a pool of half-dried blood soaking the ground. 
worst of all were the footprints, immense, clawed things that made my stomach clench. The smell hung heavy in the air too, metallic and slightly sweet, tinged with something rotten that I couldn't place. Something terrible had happened here. No bear would leave a campsite looking like this, and the footprints didn't match any animal I'd ever studied. With a growing sense of unease, I radioed in the coordinates and a brief description, requesting backup. I knew going it alone was foolish, but something deep down, some primal gut instinct, made me want to track whatever left those prints. An hour later, a search team arrived, burly, experienced folks, armed with rifles. We picked up the trail of footprints, heading deeper into the forest. They were massive, nearly double the size of a large man's foot. We also found signs of a struggle, broken branches, gouged earth, and more dark smears of blood. The sun was beginning to dip below the tree lean when we finally found it, the creature. At first, I couldn't even process what I was seeing. It was perched on a fallen log, tearing into something with its claws. The something, I realized with a jolt of horror, was the remains of a deer, its carcass half-eaten and glistening in the waning light. The creature was monstrous. Impossibly tall and lean, it was covered in a coarse, dark brown fur that rippled across powerful muscles. Its head was eerily human-like, but elongated, with a muzzle filled with rows of jagged teeth. Its eyes, glinting in the gloom, burned with a predatory yellow light. One of the team members, Jonas, startled at the sight of it, made a sudden rustle of movement. In a blur, the creature was off the log and charging. It was terrifyingly fast, covering the ground between us in seconds. We opened fire, the gunshots echoing through the trees. The creature stumbled slightly, a spray of inky blood flying as a bullet grazed its flank. But it didn't stop. Jonas went down first. The creature hit him with the force of a truck, knocking his rifle from his grip and sending him flying backward. I barely had time to register Jonas' terrified scream before the creature's claws raked across his chest, leaving deep, bloody gashes. He was dead before he even hit the ground, his body lying broken amongst the fallen leaves. The creature roared, a bone-chilling sound that sent a flock of birds scattering from the treetops. Panic and rage surged through me. I aimed my rifle, my hands trembling, and poured everything I had into those shots. One struck the creature's shoulder, another its leg. It stumbled, then turned its blazing eyes towards me. A primal sense of self-preservation screamed at me to run, but my feet were rooted to the spot. I knew I could only outrun it for so long. We stared at each other, predator and prey sizing each other up across a clearing stained with Jonas' blood. The creature, seemingly less affected by its wounds than it should have been, let out another deafening roar. It began sprinting towards me, a vision of fawn and claw and unstoppable power. Blind panic took over then. I turned and ran, fleeing through the undergrowth with the creature's pounding footsteps close behind. Branches whipped my face, tearing at my exposed skin. The creature's roar seemed to reverberate inside my skull, each one another chilling step closer to my inevitable end. I heard a gunshot behind me, then another. They were buying me time, and I prayed it would be enough. Stumbling through the dense growth, I burst through the tree lean, gasping for breath. I was at the river's edge. The opposite bank was a good thirty-foot distance away, with treacherous rapids between. I didn't hesitate, plunging into the icy water. 
As the current swept me downstream, I could hear the creature snarling with frustration on the bank. I managed to scramble onto a half-submerged boulder, catching my breath and scanning the opposite shore for salvation. Then, I saw them, the rest of the search team. They'd heard the gunshots and came running. They raised their rifles, training their sights on the opposite bank where the creature was now pacing back and forth in fury, seemingly uncertain of crossing the raging water. They opened fire. The creature, faced with this barrage of bullets, finally turned and disappeared into the dense forest, its howls of frustration echoing behind it. I collapsed onto the rock, battered, soaked, and utterly spent, my ribs aching, every nerve ending on fire. They pulled me from the river, wrapped me in a rough blanket, and the world began to spin into a blur of exhaustion and relief. That night, the creature's enraged roars haunted every half-formed dream. They never found Jonas's body. The river washed it away, another grim offering to the untamed heart of those Alaskan wilds. We reported the incident, of course, but it got filed under bare mauling, with the odd details conveniently omitted. I'm not delusional, I knew what I saw, and so did the remaining members of that team. We saw something out there that science can't explain, something born straight from campfire horror stories. Afterward, I started drinking heavily. Nightmares plagued me, vivid visions of the creature's inhuman face, the gleaming claws, the sickly sweet scent of blood. My research suffered, and my marriage crumbled under the weight of my demons. I lost my job and not long after, my wife left, a look of heartbroken pity the last I saw of her. Eventually, I wound up homeless, living out of a beat-up old truck on the outskirts of a small town. It was a far cry from my once promising life. Then came the disappearances. First, a hiker gone missing on a remote trail with only reports of a low, guttural growl and a strange lingering odor near the trailhead. Then, a lone hunter. Vanished without a trace, his rifle found abandoned in the woods. Panic rippled through the community, along with whispers of the thing I now couldn't unsee. Word reached me one rainy night, in the rundown bar where I spent most of my time nursing a bottle of cheap whiskey. It came from the mouth of a trapper, an old-timer with haunted eyes, who muttered about monstrous footprints and a foul presence lurking in the shadows of the forest. Something in me snapped. I slammed my empty glass onto the bar counter, the sudden noise echoing in the dingy silence. It was time to stop running, time to face this thing once and for all. I had nothing left to lose. Maybe, just maybe, there was still time to prevent more senseless deaths. Three days later, armed with my old hunting rifle and the last of my remaining savings spent on ammo, I made my way back into the woods. The search team years ago barely explored the area, bound by protocol, focused on recovery. I knew better. I knew the creature would retreat further into the wilderness seek a lair where it felt safe, where it could recover from its wounds. Each step into the dappled green gloom of the forest felt like walking with a weight upon my shoulders, a countdown ticking down to a final confrontation. I found its territory soon enough. Half-devoured carcasses were more frequent, their gnawed bones a grisly trail marker. The air buzzed with the thick stench of death and decay that I now recognized all too well. I spent a sleepless night camped in a natural blind overlooking a small clearing. Each rustle of leaves, every echoing hoot of an owl set my pulse racing. Yet, the creature didn't come. 
As the first rays of dawn painted the sky in soft hues of pink and orange, I was ready to accept defeat. I'd ventured out on a fool's errand, driven by either madness or desperation. I couldn't even be sure which one. Then, I caught a flicker of movement at the far edge of the clearing. The creature emerged from the treeline, its immense form moving with an unnatural grace. My heart pounded in my chest like a frantic drumbeat, but there was a strange calm settling over me, a grim acceptance of my potential fate. It had changed. The bullet wounds from our last encounter had festered, leaving angry, infected gashes across its fur. Yet, it moved with renewed strength, a testament to its frightening resilience. It had learned, adapted, grown stronger. A horrifying realization hit me, we hadn't slowed it down, we'd made it far more dangerous. I drew my rifle, the cold metal reassuringly familiar in my hands. This time, there would be no running, no panicked retreat. As the creature paused, its head tilting curiously at the sight of me, I aimed. My first shot hit it square in the chest, staggering it. Yet, it roared not in pain, but in fury. A primal scream building in my throat, I fired again and again until my rifle clicked empty. The creature faltered, stumbled, but kept coming. It was close enough now that I could smell the rotting stench of its breath, could see the madness swirling in its glowing amber eyes. I fumbled for a reload, but it was too late. The creature lunged, a blur of muscle and teeth. I braced for the killing blow, the crushing weight, the piercing pain that would end it all. Yet, as I squeezed my eyes shut, I heard not my own scream, but another roar of pain cutting through the air. Snapping my eyes open, I saw the creature had veered off course at the last minute. It lay on its side, another form tearing into its flank. A wolf, a massive silver beast, had appeared from the undergrowth and now harried the creature mercilessly. The wolf bit and slashed, dodging the clumsy swipes of massive claws, drawing the creature's attention from me completely. Seizing the opportunity, I scrambled back, reloading my rifle with trembling hands. Wounded and distracted, the creature finally turned to flee, its roars echoing through the clearing. The wolf, its fur stained red with the creature's blood, didn't pursue. It turned, and for a heartbeat, our eyes met. In those wild, golden eyes I saw neither bloodlust nor the mindless hunger of a predator, but a chilling intelligence, a sense of calculated purpose. Then, it vanished into the green depths, leaving me alone to process the impossible scene I'd just witnessed. When help arrived, alerted by the gunshots, I said nothing of the wolf, only of the creature's retreat. The official report blamed everything on a rogue bear. No one would have believed me anyway. I didn't return to that town or the bottle. Something in me had shifted. I travel now, taking temporary work wherever I can, a nomad forever seeking and never finding quite what I'm looking for. The open road has become my sanctuary, a lonely respite where the nightmares are less frequent. Out there, under the vast expanse of the sky, the creature feels less like an ominous shadow and more like just one of the many dark secrets hidden in the world's forgotten corners. Yet, late at night, I sometimes catch sight of those glowing amber eyes in the darkness bordering the highway, a flicker of yellow among the trees. Is it the same creature, tracking my movements? Has the wolf sent word of my existence? Or maybe I'm seeing things the darkness of the open road playing tricks on a fractured mind. All I know for sure is this, 
The world is wilder and far more mysterious than we pretend, and the old stories, the campfire tales whispered for generations, hold truths we dismiss at our peril. And somewhere out there, a creature roams the wilderness, scarred and hungry, biding its time, perhaps waiting to cross paths with me once more. My name's Toby Miller, and this happened to me back in the spring of 2015. I'm a wildlife biologist by trade, and at the time, I was running surveys out in the remote part of the Cherokee National Forest in Tennessee. It's rugged territory, the kind of place where cell service is a forgotten luxury, and the folks in the nearest towns give you a funny look if you ask for gluten-free bread. But it's beautiful country, the woods thick and old, and the job suits my solitary nature. This particular day, I was miles from the logging road where I'd left my truck. I'd been setting up camera traps along a game trail, looking for signs of the growing bear population. When the sun started getting low, I packed up my gear, ready to hike back through the thick trees before it got too dark to see properly. I just started back when the smell hit me. Rotten meat and something else, musky and sickly sweet at the same time. It turned my stomach. At first, I couldn't place it, then my training kicked in. A carcass, something big. I was supposed to report stuff like that, but with the fading light, curiosity got the better of me. It didn't take long to find the source of the smell. In a small clearing, slumped at the base of a tree, was a deer, a big buck. Its hide was torn in places, ribs broken and exposed, yet there were no signs of any struggle nearby. Just the carcass left there like a hiker might ditch a half-eaten energy bar. Predators don't work that way. They either eat what they kill or drag it off to make it last. And nothing around here was big enough to take down a buck this size without leaving so much as a blood trail. It was the strangeness of it all that led me closer, my biologist instincts overriding the part of my brain that was getting more and more uneasy. That's when I saw the handprints. Pressed into the soft mud next to the carcass were enormous hand-like tracks, wider than anything human, with thick claws at the ends. They made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. My pulse was pounding in my ears. Then a twig snapped somewhere behind me. Whirling around, I scanned the deepening shadows, expecting a mountain lion. Maybe a bear even though it didn't fit with the kill. But whatever made those prints wasn't there anymore. Just the stillness of the forest. After that, I hightailed it out of there, leaving the camera traps behind. Back at my truck, sweat-soaked and breathing hard, logic started to trickle back in. It was too dark for reliable identification. My mind must have been playing tricks. Next morning, I forced myself to head back, armed with a hefty camera and my hunting rifle, just in case. By the harsh daylight, those handprints looked even more impossible, yet there they were, clear as could be. I got shots of them from every angle for documentation, though the photos never properly captured the size how they seemed to press abnormally deep into the earth. The deer carcass was where I left it, untouched overnight, which was another thing that made no sense. I reported it to a game warden back in town, a buddy of mine named Frank. He was skeptical, but humored me, came out and took a look. Frank, with his years of wilderness experience, was just as puzzled as me. He took more photos, swabbed some samples for the lab, and we both decided it was worth setting up a camera to see if we could catch whatever did this coming back. The next two weeks were a waiting game. 
I checked the camera obsessively, sleeping at my office more often than my apartment. Every image was just more squirrels, birds, the occasional raccoon. Nothing unusual. And then, one morning, there it was. Not a creature, but a man. A big one. Six and a half feet tall at least, powerfully built even under the bulky hunting camo he wore. It was near dusk in the photo, his face obscured in shadow. What made the hair stand up on my arms were his hands, which were even bigger than the prints I'd found. The fingers looked too thick, the knuckles too pronounced. Frank and I studied the photos for hours but found no other identifying details. No unusual gear, no vehicle in the background, and the lab work came back inconclusive. We sent the images to every forestry agency, every fish and wildlife department we could think of, even circulated them discreetly on some Bigfoot enthusiast forums. Nobody could place the guy. It was maddening. Frank kept the photo on his desk, mostly as a joke. He started calling it Tree Man given how big this mystery guy was, and somehow the name stuck. Every few months, I'd call to see if anything new had turned up, but it was always the same answer, nothing. For a while, I kept going back to that area of the forest, a mix of caution and something more primal like I was being drawn there. But I never found any other tracks, no other sign of Tree Man, no other kills that defied explanation. It was like he vanished into the trees as quickly as he had appeared. Even now, years later, I think about him sometimes. Wonder about what brought him out there, so far from civilization. Wonder if those hands of his ended up hurting someone, some hiker who got lost on the wrong trail at the wrong time. Wonder if, somewhere out in that vast stretch of Tennessee wilderness, he's still watching, waiting, and leaving behind only impossible clues for some poor soul like me to stumble over. Life changed. Not all at once, but subtly at first. That encounter had rattled the foundations of my understanding of the world, and the tremors were only starting. I became obsessed. Tree Man occupied my thoughts, even slipping into my dreams, fragmented images of impossibly large hands, flashes of eyes glowing in the dark, and that rotting sweet smell clinging to everything. My job performance slipped. I spent hours scouring the internet for any local legends, unexplained disappearances, anything that might offer a connection. Frank got concerned. He showed up at my door one Friday night with a six-pack, saying we needed to talk. He was blunt as always. Toby, you chasing ghosts here? This tree man thing, it's eating you alive. Time to let go, move on, before you become that crazy recluse everyone says lives in the woods. We talked far into the night, me spilling out. Bits and pieces, theories that even I knew sounded half-cocked. Frank, bless him, listened. In the end, he offered a compromise, one born of worry but also knowing my stubborn streak. Look. If it gives you some closure, we'll go out one last time. Camp a few nights, set up some cameras in new spots, do a proper sweep. Then, win or lose, you gotta leave it be. A few weeks later, we headed back to the area around the deer carcass site. It felt both foreign and familiar. We spread out our gear further, cameras placed strategically trying to predict possible routes, to think like someone who wanted to stay hidden. The days passed in a strange sort of tension. Every rustle of leaves, every branch snapping in the distance, had me jumping. Frank, ever the realist, 
chalked it up to regular forest noises, even made some jokes about me jump-starting the local Bigfoot tourism industry with my wild theories. It helped lighten the mood, but that underlying unease was always there. That third night, I woke with a start just before dawn to the sound of a scream. It was distant, echoing through the trees, but unmistakably human. I fumbled for my rifle, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. Frank! I whispered, shaking his shoulder. Did you hear that? He shot upright, sleep fogged eyes clearing in an instant. Yeah, came from the east. Let's move. We didn't bother packing. Gear could wait, if someone was hurt, we needed to find them fast. Following the fading echoes of the scream, we charged through the underbrush, branches whipping our faces and fallen logs tripping our feet. The adrenaline masked the pain, our flashlights cutting through the pre-dawn gloom. We found our clearing, a tangled mess of thorn bushes and broken branches. There was blood spatter on the leaves, a shredded backpack, and a single shoe lying abandoned. And in the center, curled up and sobbing in terror, was a woman, maybe in her twenties. She looked like she had been running for her life. Her name was Amelia, a student from out of state visiting the national park. She described getting lost on a solo hike, getting turned around when it got dark, and then being stalked. She kept babbling about a monster, a giant, and then she would just break down again. The adrenaline crash hit me hard. This wasn't some reclusive hermit messing with my head. This was real, a woman barely escaping with her life. That image of Tree Man from the camera flashed in my mind. Could it be the same person? Did he escalate from stalking to attacking? Frank called it in. Given Amelia's description, we decided against staying put and opted to get her back to civilization as fast as possible. Search and rescue teams would swarm the area soon enough. The hike out was agonizing. Every few minutes, Amelia would jump at some noise, crying out in fear. Frank kept her between us, murmuring reassurances, his eyes constantly scanning our surroundings. I held the rifle at the ready, feeling a sick mix of dread and grim determination. This wouldn't go unanswered. We made it back to the logging road by mid-morning, the sun finally cresting above the treetops. As the rangers and paramedics swarmed Amelia, Frank pulled me aside. Toby, I saw something out there when we were bringing her out, he said, his voice low. Footprints, big ones, like your tree man photos. We ventured back a short way, carefully avoiding disturbing any potential evidence. There they were, just as Frank had described, prints so large they barely looked human. They led towards a tangle of underbrush and then disappeared. That afternoon, news spread about the attack, the whispers of a dangerous wild man lurking in the forest making the local news. Search teams fanned out with tracker dogs, helicopters buzzing overhead. Despite the massive sweep and the media frenzy that followed, no trace of our suspect was ever found. No body, no blood. Nothing but those damning footprints in Amelia's terrified account. The aftermath wasn't pretty. Amelia's story was sensationalized, fueling the fire of local legends and attracting every armchair monster hunter and conspiracy theorist within a hundred mile radius. The Cherokee National Forest, once my sanctuary, became a place where curiosity and fear mingled with the scent of pine. I tried to put it behind me, to focus on my job, but the fear lingered like a cold fog that wouldn't burn off. 
My hikes became shorter, confined to well-marked trails close to the roads. I started carrying heavier weaponry than necessary for my wildlife surveys, and even caught myself glancing over my shoulder in the grocery store parking lot. Frank retired not long after. We'd both seen something that defied classification out there, something that gnawed away at our sense of order. We never spoke of it explicitly, but I think he carried a heavier burden than even I did. Sometimes, he calls just to talk about fishing or the weather, but we both know what's unspoken, the darkness that lingers on the edge of the trees. As for me, I'm still here, still a wildlife biologist by title, though something in me broke that day deep in the woods. There's a line now, one I know not to cross, a limit to my exploration. Some mysteries are better left unsolved, some shadows are better left undisturbed. After all, you can study every animal in the books, but there will always be the ones that exist only in the corner of your vision just beyond the reach of your carefully documented and categorized world. My name's Marcus Dunn, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2008. I'm what you might call a modern-day hermit. Been living out in a cabin in the Olympic National Forest for close to a decade. Left the rat race behind, wanted some peace. Turns out, peace can get real strange out here. On this particular day, I was surveying a logging block a good hike from my cabin. Routine stuff, finding property lines, marking trees. But as the afternoon sun started dipping, a sense of unease settled over me. I know those woods like the back of my hand, but that day, it all felt off. The birds stopped singing, like someone flipped a switch. And the silence wasn't just quiet, it felt heavy. That's when I found it, an abandoned hunting camp, a place someone used seasonally. Except something about it was just wrong. The small tent was ripped to shreds, like an animal tore it apart instead of a storm. Supplies were scattered, empty water bottles torn food wrappers, a bent flashlight, and the smell, like wet fur and something else I couldn't place, sweet but rotting at the same time. Now, cougars and bears, they're no strangers out here, but this wasn't their work. The footprints around the camp were huge, way too big for anything normal. There were no claw marks, though, at least that I could find which was even weirder. I was doing my best to piece it all together when a low growl echoed from deeper in the woods. Sent a shiver down my spine. I scanned the trees, saw a flash of movement just at the edge of my vision. There it was again, a pair of eyes glowing in the shadows, a greenish-gold color unlike any animal around here. I was armed, a precaution out here. I slowly reached back for the rifle on my shoulder, fingers fumbling slightly. But as I turned, the eyes were gone, the growling stopped. Had I imagined it all? No, definitely not. The campsite was real, the smell lingered in the air. Another growl, louder, much closer now. I swung around, raising the rifle on instinct and in the dim light, I saw it. Hulking, at least seven feet tall, hunched over with massive shoulders. It was covered in dark, coarse fur, its face elongated, its teeth bared in a snarl that made the hair on my arms stand on end. It wasn't a bear, wolf, or anything else I recognized. It made a low, guttural sound and lunged. Instincts kicked in, and I fired, the gunshot echoing through the trees. The creature let out a roar, more of pain than surprise, and staggered back. I didn't wait to see the damage. 
I bolted, the rifle clutched tight, running blindly through the forest as the sounds of crashing branches followed behind. My heart was pounding like a drum against my ribs. All those years alone, and I'd finally met something out there that couldn't be explained, that didn't belong in any textbook. Fear gave me an extra burst of speed, and that desperate flight might have been what saved me. After what felt like forever but was probably only minutes, I spotted a break in the trees. It was the old logging road that ran near my property. I sprinted towards it, lungs burning, the sound of the creature crashing through the underbrush still close behind. I made it to the road, fumbled in my pocket for my truck keys. The truck was parked just up ahead, blessedly unlocked in that moment of urgency. I threw myself inside, slamming the door shut as I brought the engine to life. My hands were shaking so badly I barely got the key in the ignition. Gravel flew as I peeled away from the spot, the old truck protesting under the sudden strain. A quick glance in the rearview mirror showed the edge of the tree line, and for a heartbeat, I thought I saw a dark shape watching from the shadows. Adrenaline still coursing through me, I kept pushing, not stopping until I burst out onto the main highway miles away. That night, safe in my cabin with every single light on, I radioed in the location of the abandoned camp and my encounter. The Forest Service folks were skeptical but polite about it. Ranger Watkins, who I knew from my time in town, came out by himself a few days later. We went back to that place in the woods. The campsite was just as I had left it, though everything seemed dulled under the daylight sun. Watkins did a thorough search, found more of those big tracks, but he couldn't say for sure what they belonged to. Probably a bear, he said but we both knew I'd seen something different. Weeks after that, a couple of hikers went missing a few ridges over from my area. Search and rescue went out, but they found nothing, not a trace. Whispers went around town about it being a cougar, some even started hinting at the old legends, the stuff nobody was supposed to believe in anymore. And I... I never went back to that section of woods, requested a reassignment to the southern end of the forest. It wasn't the fear that got me, though there was plenty of that to go around. No, it was the not knowing. Because there, in the shadows of those trees, I got proof that some things slip between the cracks of what we think is real, things older and wilder than we'll ever understand. And sometimes, for reasons we can't fathom, those things choose to reveal themselves. The new assignment gave me a change of scenery, but those glowing eyes haunted me. Every rustle in the underbrush, every snapped twig, had me jumping. For a while, I told myself I was being paranoid. After all, I had made it out unscathed. But deep down, I knew that the encounter had changed something in me, had cracked open a window into a world I wasn't sure I wanted to see. Winter came and went. Things were eerily quiet. Not a single whisper about missing hikers or strange sightings. Just the usual gossip about deer sightings and the price of firewood in town. Maybe it had been a strange, isolated incident. I started to convince myself. Maybe whatever that thing was had moved on. Yet, I couldn't shake the feeling it was out there still, biding its time. Spring thawed the last remnants of ice in the high country, and restlessness took hold of me. That familiar itch to be out in the woods started to nag. Despite everything, they were still my home. I decided to revisit the area, not the exact spot where I'd encountered the creature, but close enough to keep an eye on things. I planned carefully. 
I loaded the truck with extra supplies, told Ranger Watkins I'd be hiking the western side of the range for a few days, just in case something happened. I armed myself, not just my standard issue rifle, but a heavy duty handgun as well. I wasn't going to be caught unprepared again. My first couple of days out passed in a state of high alert. I saw fleeting shadows that turned into deer, heard branches snap under the weight of squirrels. Every footprint I scrutinized. My nerves were stretched tight as a bowstring, every muscle tense with anticipation. And then, on the third night, I saw the firelight. It flickered between the trees too bright for an abandoned campfire, too controlled to be a wildfire. Something prickled at the back of my neck. I crept closer, moving as silently as I could. What I saw would stay with me for the rest of my days. In a clearing, a crude camp was set up, canvas stretched roughly over poles, a fire pit smoldering with unidentifiable bones and scraps. And there, in the flickering light, were three figures. They sat hunched around the fire, not human but close enough to send another wave of dread washing over me. Tall and rangy, they moved with an awkward grace. Their skin was a patchwork of leathery gray and coarse, dirty fur. And their faces, those were the worst. Long and angular, with flat noses and wide mouths filled with far too many pointed teeth. What disturbed me most was their clothes. They wore tattered remnants of what I recognized as the missing hiker's gear, a torn backpack, a faded jacket, a hiking boot dangling off a clawed hand. I had stumbled onto their lair. I should have left. Run for my life and alerted the authorities. But rage and adrenaline coursed through me, overpowering common sense. This wasn't some lone predator, this was something worse. I wasn't going to let them keep terrorizing these woods, preying on innocent people. My plan was reckless. I circled around the camp, using the cover of the trees to position myself on a high rock overlooking them. The moonlight was enough to give me a decent shot. I took aim, my finger squeezing the trigger slowly. The first shot rang out, hitting one of the creatures square in the chest. It let out a piercing shriek, a mix of surprise and pain, and collapsed to the ground. The other two scattered, their movements disjointed but frighteningly fast, hissing and snarling as they searched for cover. I fired twice more, the echoes of gunshots bouncing through the trees. One of the creatures let out another pained cry, stumbling and tripping, but it didn't fall. The other disappeared into the darkness. For a moment, the clearing was filled with swirling dust and confused sounds, and I held my breath, waiting for them to charge. But the remaining creature wasn't attacking. It crouched over its fallen comrade, making low whimpering sounds I couldn't understand. It looked up, and for the first time, I saw its eyes directly. Those same golden eyes that haunted my nightmares, but this time with something else in them, shock, grief, maybe even a flicker of fear. It scooped up the dead creature, its movements surprisingly gentle, and vanished into the shadows. I didn't pursue them. Something had shifted in that moment. The battle rage drained from me, replaced by a bone-deep weariness and a strange hollowness in my chest. That night, I packed my gear, hiking through the pre-dawn darkness back to my truck. I didn't sleep a wink. At first light, I drove back into town and went straight to Ranger Watkins' office. I told him everything, the encounter a year ago, the things in the clearing, the shots fired. He listened, 
his skepticism giving way to grim concern as I recounted the tale. We assembled a team, rangers, volunteer search and rescue, even a couple of National Guardsmen who were stationed nearby. We scoured the woods, tracing the area I had described, searching for any sign of the creatures or their camp. But all we found were a few lingering prints in the mud and a piece of torn canvas snagged down a branch. Whatever I had stumbled upon that night had vanished. The aftermath was a mess of red tape and whispers. Officially, the incident was attributed to poachers, the missing hikers to animal attacks. They even came up with a fabricated story about finding drug paraphernalia, anything to avoid the truth. Watkins kept my involvement quiet, respecting that I was done dealing with things no normal man should see. I stayed on with the Forest Service, but something in me was broken. The wilderness I had loved felt tainted. Those trees held secrets I didn't want to know, harbored monsters that defied any rational explanation. The town grew suspicious, their stairs held accusation as talk spread. Evenings at the local bar where everyone knew my name turned into silent side glances and hurried exits. The solitude I had craved all my life turned into a curse of isolation. A few years later, I started writing everything down. Maybe if I could put it into words, make them see what I saw, then it would all feel less real somehow. Maybe then it wouldn't eat at my soul quite so much. So here it is, my story. Believe it or don't, it doesn't matter anymore. I know what's out there. I know that whatever peace I had with those woods is shattered. I know that in the darkest shadows, hidden from sight, things still lurk, and that even the most experienced woodsman can stumble upon a horror that haunts him to his grave. My name is Declan Shea, and this happened to me back in the fall of 97. I was working for the Forest Service up in Washington's Olympic Peninsula, a wild land of rainforests, moss-covered trees, and peaks that disappear into the clouds. You feel small out there, humbled by the raw power of nature. One morning while on patrol, I came across a campsite in utter ruin. The small tent looked like something had stomped on it, and supplies were scattered everywhere, some half-gnawed and reeking of an unnatural, rotten stench. In the mud were footprints larger than those of any bear I'd ever seen, their clawed toes gouging deep into the wet soil. My heart pounded an uneven rhythm, a primal sense of unease washing over me. Yet, it wasn't fear that kept me there but a chilling curiosity mixed with a sense of duty. Someone, or something, was out there, and I was the only one with the skills and the equipment to track it. Foolish or brave, I followed those monstrous tracks, plunging deeper into the ancient heart of the rainforest. They led uphill, into denser growth where the sunlight barely penetrated and a constant drizzle made the ground slick and treacherous. The creature, whatever it was, didn't try to conceal its passing. Branches snapped overhead, the sound echoing through the eerily still air. The stench grew heavier, almost overwhelming. Then, as the rain intensified, Transforming into a downpour that washed away any hope of clear tracks, I stumbled into a clearing and froze in my tracks. Three deer carcasses lay broken and mangled, stripped down to the bone in a manner no scavenger would. And before I could register what I was seeing next to the blood-soaked carnage, it moved. From behind a moss-covered boulder emerged a nightmare-given form. It was immense, easily eight feet tall at the shoulder, with long, powerful limbs that moved with terrifying, purposeful silence. Thick, 
dark fur clung to its muscular form, dripping with rain. Its head was like a monstrous hybrid of wolf and human, a long, toothy muzzle ending in a black, wet nose. But the most chilling detail by far were its eyes, glowing a piercing, intelligent yellow under the leaden sky. We locked eyes, hunter and hunter. Time seemed to freeze as the air crackled with primal awareness. I brought my rifle up, not out of hope it would stop the beast, but out of some ingrained instinct, a feeble attempt at defiance. The creature seemed to ponder me for a moment, its massive head tilting ever so slightly as if assessing its prey. A low growl rumbled deep in its throat, the sound resonating through my bones a symphony of primeval hunger. Then, without warning, it turned and surged back into the green gloom of the forest, disappearing in a matter of heartbeats. I stood there, drenched to the skin, rain mixing with the sweat chilling on my brow. What the hell had I just seen? Shaken yet compelled, I spent the rest of the day scouring the surrounding area trying to make sense of the monstrous tracks, the slaughter in the glade, and my unsettling encounter. There was no denying it, something unnameable, something far beyond established science or campfire tales, was stalking those woods. By nightfall, despite the bone-deep exhaustion, sleep was a distant dream. Every rustle of wind-blown leaves sent my pulse racing. I felt watched from the darkness, sensed those yellow eyes burning from just beyond my flickering campfire's reach. At first light, I abandoned my camp, packed in frantic haste, and radioed for extraction. I knew in my gut that I couldn't stay. Each report I filed with my superiors was met with dismissive chuckles or thinly veiled concerns about a nervous breakdown. No one believed a word of it, of course. It was easier to dismiss me as crazy than to acknowledge that the world may hold terrors far beyond our understanding. My resignation was handed in shortly after. Leaving the job also meant leaving everything familiar behind. The old logging community in the Olympic Peninsula, my regular runs on forest trails, the folks at the diner who knew my order by heart, all now felt tainted by the memory of the creature, by the knowledge that I was marked. Months turned into years of a nomadic existence. I slept in my truck, moving from town to town, never staying long in one place, the shadows at my back growing longer each night. Friendships were a luxury I couldn't afford, my stories pushing me to the fringes, branding me a lunatic. The weight of knowing but not being believed bore down heavier than any backpack. I learned to keep my mouth shut, even as reports of strange sightings and animal mutilations surfaced, grim echoes of my own terrifying ordeal. Then, a whisper on the wind led me to Idaho, to a tiny town nestled on the edge of a vast wilderness area. There, rumors swirled around the barstools, the locals nervously sharing hushed tales of something monstrous lurking deep in the Selkirk Mountains. It sounded sickeningly familiar, the footprints, the unnatural smell, the missing livestock. It felt like the creature had played a cruel trick, leading me across states and years right back into a hunter's game I couldn't win. Yet within me, Alongside the familiar fear, simmered a reckless kind of determination. I've learned a few things during my tortured years on the run, how to move unseen, how to become a shadow myself. Perhaps, if I couldn't stop the creature, I could track it, document its movements, expose some shred of proof that would crack the veil of disbelief, of comfortable ignorance. And maybe, just maybe, there was someone else out there, some other survivor marked by the same terrifying knowledge, and we wouldn't have to carry the burden alone. Tomorrow, armed with more supplies than I should rightfully need, 
I set out for the Selkirks, hoping against hope that this time, the forest won't swallow me whole. The Selkirks greeted me with a raw, desolate beauty. Serrated peaks speared through the clouds, ancient forests clung to their slopes, and silence settled over everything like a heavy blanket. I felt both insignificant and strangely at home. The creature had brought me back to my element, the wilds. Here, it wasn't just my battle but nature's, the harsh struggle to survive against impossible odds. I followed its trail with the patience and tenacity of a wolf on the hunt, studying half-eaten carcasses and the unnatural cadence of its massive footprints. The evidence led me ever deeper into the mountain maze, down into forgotten valleys and up towards wind-scoured peaks. Each step took me closer to confrontation, to a chilling reckoning. Days bled into each other, a blur of adrenaline and sleepless nights spent shivering under the vast, uncaring sky. I found myself talking to the trees, the moon, the echoing absence, an attempt to fill the oppressive silence, to ward off the creeping madness gnawing at the edges of my sanity. The creature felt both tantalizingly close and frustratingly elusive, its presence a constant, oppressive weight in the air. One bone-chilling evening, as a shroud of mist clung to the pines like ragged ghosts, I saw it again. It was perched on a ridge, silhouetted against the fading light as it surveyed its domain. Even from a distance, its sheer size sent a fresh wave of panic through me. Yet instead of fleeing, I inched closer, my movements painstakingly slow, blending into the landscape like a chameleon. This was my chance a desperate gamble to document the creature up close, to prove I wasn't crazy. It vanished as silently as it appeared, leaving behind only the echo of its presence and the lingering fear that it saw me too. Fueled by a mix of terror and reckless resolve, I pushed on, following its tracks as they crisscrossed the treacherous slopes. Then, the trail led me downhill, to a hidden valley carpeted in dense ferns and fallen trees. I approached with a hunter's caution, rifle at the ready, feeling the same preternatural certainty a predator has when closing in on its prey. The air thickened, the musky scent almost unbearable. I knew I was close. Too close. Suddenly, the creature burst from the undergrowth with stunning speed, a blur of fur and teeth. I fired more out of panic than accuracy, the shots deafening in the enclosed space. It roared, a sound that shook the very ground beneath my feet. Then it was on me, a crushing weight knocking me off balance. My rifle flew uselessly from my grasp as I thrashed and fought for my life. Time twisted into chaos. I remember claws tearing through fabric and flesh flashes of pain, and the horrifying knowledge that these were my final moments. I smelled its fetid breath, saw the hunger gleaming in those predatory eyes inches from my own. I screamed, more in defiance than in hope of rescue. Then, in a split second that felt like an eternity, the creature froze. It let out a startled snarl, rearing back with such abruptness I was thrown clear. Confusion mingled with terror as I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo. That's when I saw them, two figures emerging from the trees. A man and a woman, both dressed in camouflage and moving with woodsman's stealth that spoke of a lifetime spent in the wilds. They held rifles too, weapons that looked far more powerful and menacing than my own meager defense. Before I could shout, cry for help, or even register what was happening, the man fired. One shot, clean and precise. The creature stumbled back with a deafening bellow of pain and rage, then turned and melted into the undergrowth, 
leaving a trail of dark blood staining the ferns. I stood frozen, unable to process the sudden turn of events, my battered body screaming in protest. My rescuers moved towards me with unsettling weariness, their weapons still trained in the general direction the creature had disappeared. Are you hurt bad? the woman asked, her voice low and rough. I nodded numbly, still not fully comprehending, still adrift in the aftermath of adrenaline. They were real, solid, undeniably human. Not the stuff of paranoid nightmares, but flesh and blood saviors. Over the next hour, in halting sentences and shocked disbelief, I shared my story. It spilled forth in a torrent, my first sighting in the Olympics, the years of solitary fear, the desperation that had driven me back into the beast's path. I told them about the close calls, the whispered rumors ignored by a disbelieving world. The couple listened in silence, their expressions a mix of pity, skepticism, and something else I couldn't quite decipher. When I was finished, the man finally spoke. Name's Caden. This is my daughter, Bryn. We've been tracking that thing for longer than you think. His eyes were the color of a stormy sky. They held both a deep sadness and a fierce determination that sent a flicker of hope through my battered soul. Later, as Caden bandaged my wounds and Bryn started a small fire, they shared their own story. It was one of loss, of loved ones taken by the creature in these very mountains over generations. Their family had become its reluctant keepers, studying its patterns and hunting it in turn, a desperate, endless cycle seeking not victory, but mere survival, some scrap of control in the face of the unknowable. A strange, exhausted peace settled over me as dusk painted the valley in shadows. I wasn't alone anymore. Out here, my crazy story found believers. The shared knowledge, the weight of that terrible truth, it was both a crushing burden and a bittersweet relief. We talked long into the night, trading stories, warnings, and our hard-won, terrible knowledge of the creature lurking in the wilderness. The future remains uncertain. Our hunt continues, a desperate gamble against an enemy far more cunning and enduring than anything science books can explain. We'll continue our fight, drive it back deeper into the shadows, keep it from terrorizing innocent lives. And if we're lucky, Maybe even find some form of grim justice lost somewhere in those vast, unyielding mountains. My name is Elias Cartwright, and this happened to me back in the fall of 96. I worked as a backcountry ranger in Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone is a wild, beautiful beast of a place. All geothermal wonders and dense old-growth forests sprawled across thousands of acres. It's the kind of place that makes you feel small yet powerful at the same time. Out in the woods, in an isolated corner of the park, I stumbled upon a campsite straight out of a nightmare. The tent was a mangled mess of ripped canvas, shredded gear was scattered around it, and a pool of blood stained the ground. Whatever happened here, it wasn't an elk attack. It was something far more vicious and calculated. Footprints surrounded the site, massive, clawed imprints unlike anything I'd ever seen. That heavy, faintly rotten smell tickled my nostrils too, a scent that sent a shiver down my spine. My training told me to stay objective, assess the scene, then radio for backup but a nagging instinct told me there wasn't time. Following the deep, deliberate footprints, I headed into the trees. Part of me hoped this was a poacher's campsite, a human threat I could handle, but deep down I knew I was kidding myself. 
the trail wound through thick undergrowth and tangled roots. It was clear I was tracking something massive and powerful. Then, I stumbled upon the first body. It was strung up between two pines, clothes torn, limbs twisted at impossible angles, eyes frozen wide in a mask of terror. It was Sam, a fellow ranger I'd bumped into at the station a week back, the friendly laugh lines crinkling his face a distant memory. Something deep inside me snapped. I turned away and emptied the contents of my stomach onto the forest floor. Wiping my mouth and spurred on by a mixture of grief and fury, I pushed further into the woods. Each broken branch, each rustle of wind, set my pulse hammering. I knew I was being hunted now. And as the sun began to sink below the treetops, turning the forest into a shadowy maze, I saw it. Crouched on a rock outcropping, silhouetted against the fading light, was a creature that made my blood run cold. It was immense, easily twice the size of a bear, with thick, corded muscles rippling beneath a shaggy coat of inky fur. Its head was large and vaguely human-shaped with a long, toothy muzzle and eyes that burned an intense, predatory yellow. It turned those eyes on me, pinning me in place with their malevolent gaze. I stood frozen. Every instinct told me to run, but my feet disobeyed. The creature uncoiled from its crouch, its movement deceptively fluid for something of its bulk. Slowly, deliberately, it began to descend the rock face, stalking towards me. For a wild, panicked heartbeat, I thought of Sam, of his mangled body hanging from the pines and resolved to not go down without a fight. I fumbled for my rifle, the cold metal barely a reassurance against what loomed towards me. As the creature closed the distance, I raised the gun, took aim, and started firing. The shots rang out, echoing through the trees. The creature roared, a terrifying sound that shook the air. Each bullet struck drawing a spray of blackish blood, but the creature didn't fall. It barely slowed. Out of bullets, I threw the now useless rifle aside. The creature was barely twenty feet away, closing in, its fetid breath washing over me. Desperation fueled me. I charged, not in a vain hope of escape, but driven by a primal need to fight back against certain death. The creature was surprised, thrown off balance by the wildness of my attack. I slammed into it, driving my shoulder into its massive chest. We both staggered, and I felt something snap under the impact. My own shoulder maybe, ribs too, judging by the blinding flash of pain. I stumbled back and the creature recovered quickly. It snarled, lunged, swiping at me with claws like butcher's knives. I twisted, narrowly avoiding the scything claws, but its momentum carried it right past me. As it stumbled to regain its footing, I acted. With a strength born of desperation, I snatched up a thick, fallen branch, jagged end protruding like a spear. The creature roared with renewed fury, turning. I leaped. With an agonized grunt, I drove the makeshift spear deep into its side. Blackish blood gushed out, and it howled. Pain and rage contorted its monstrous features. It swiped at me again, but this time I was ready. I ducked, rolling clear of its claws and wrenched the branch free in a sickening burst of wetness. The creature staggered, its yellow eyes widening in shock. It let out a low, guttural moan and took a faltering step backward. Another. Then, with what almost sounded like a whimper, it turned and crashed back into the undergrowth. 
I watched it disappear into the green gloom, heart pounding, body trembling, unsure why it had retreated. Had I injured it badly enough? Had it simply grown tired of the fight? Had it decided I wasn't worth the effort? I didn't know. What I did know was that it was wounded, and it was still out there. Stumbling back towards the campsite, I found my discarded rifle, reloaded with shaking hands, and continued with painful, labored steps. The adrenaline was wearing off, every breath a sharp stab in my ribs. Still, I pushed through the underbrush, the creature's pain roars echoing in the distance behind me. When I finally got back to the campsite, Sam's body was gone. Not a trace of him remained among the shredded tent and blood-soaked earth. The chilling realization hit me, the creature didn't leave victims merely to die. It took them, consumed them, leaving nothing behind. My radio crackled to life. It was base camp, checking in, having found no response to their earlier calls. I choked out a breathless, panicked report of what had happened, and the chilling truth that there was something out there, something horrific, something beyond any science book explanation. It took them hours to reach me, a heavily armed team led by veteran rangers. The sight of their familiar faces calmed a sliver of the terror coursing through me. After a brief medical assessment, patching me up as best they could, we followed the creature's trail of blood. It led to a cave, its entrance yawning open at the base of a cliff face. The stench rolling out was overpowering, a mix of rotting meat and something fouler, something that spoke of primal, otherworldly hunger. My protests went unheard. The rangers were too seasoned to be scared off by campfire stories. They entered the cave, flashlights slicing through the gloom, rifles raised. I followed behind, nausea swirling in my gut, knowing whatever we found in there would forever change our understanding of that wild, magnificent park. The cave stank of blood and rot, the moist earth strewn with bones animal and sickeningly, human. We moved deeper, the darkness pressing heavy around us. Then, the flashlights found it, hunched in the shadows, back turned towards us. Its fur was matted with gore, and it was tearing into something large and bloody. A ranger yelled, a warning and a challenge, the sound echoing off the damp walls. The creature world, surprise evident in its yellow eyes. Then, it saw the intruders into its lair, and the surprise was replaced by raw, territorial fury. With a deafening roar, it charged. Gunfire thundered in the enclosed space, the muzzle flashes momentarily blinding. The creature jolted with each hit, but it kept coming. Driven into a corner, we emptied our magazines into the monstrous form, a desperate barrage against unstoppable savagery. Then, abruptly, it was over. The creature crashed to the ground, its roars replaced by gurgling gasps. In the dim light, it lay still. Slowly, cautiously, we approached. It was dead its once terrifying form now a grotesque mass of blood, ragged fur, and broken bone. Silence settled over the cave, a jarring stillness after the chaos of gunfire. One of the rangers stepped forward to deliver the final shot, the standard procedure to ensure something this dangerous was truly dead. He fired. The creature twitched in response and a strangled cry tore from his lips. It wasn't dead. It wasn't even close to dead. In a horrifying display of resilience, the creature lunged. It was a blur of motion too fast to follow with the eye, and before any of us could react, it was among us. The cave filled with screams, 
more gunshots, and guttural roars. What happened in the following minutes was a chaotic blur I still struggle to process. I remember the ranger's blood splattering my face, the smell of gunpowder mingling with the stench of the beast, the sickening crunch of bone. Then, as suddenly as it had attacked, the creature retreated. It vanished into the blackness at the heart of the cave, leaving behind a trail of carnage and echoing wails of agony. When backup arrived, drawn by the gunshots, I was the only one still alive. The rest of the team were either dead or horrifically wounded. Rescue turned to recovery, hauling broken bodies out of the cave while I stood by, numb and in shock, my ranger uniform soaked with the blood of comrades. Afterward, the park was shut down, teams of scientists and who knows who else crawling over the area. I was debriefed, questioned my broken ribs and shattered psyche disregarded in favor of extracting every terrifying detail for their reports. The official explanation? A tragic bear attack, the worst in park history. I was given leave, a meager pension, and instructed to keep my mouth shut for the good of the park, the good of the public. Told to forget. I tried. Moved across the country, hid myself in a little apartment on the edge of a bustling city, anywhere far removed from the whispering pines and the looming shadows of dense forests. But the nightmares followed. I see those burning yellow eyes in every dark alleyway, hear the crunch of bones underfoot on every littered street. And at night, when the city sleeps, I sometimes hear the low, rumbling growl echoing down the street, followed by the sound of terrified screams cut short. News reports pop up here and there, vanishings in national parks, sightings of something large and unknown, followed by ominous silence. No bodies, no proof, just gaping holes of unexplained absences attributed to wild animals and tragic accidents. I know they're lying. I know there are more of these creatures out there, smarter, adapting, learning to avoid our technology and our scrutiny. I know this because sometimes, when the moon is full, I catch a whiff of that sweet, rotten odor drifting over the rooftops, a chilling testament that the wilderness, the untamed heart of the world, holds far darker secrets than we can imagine and whatever monstrous things lurk out there are growing hungrier by the day. My name is Killian Forrester, and this happened to me back in the fall of 99. I was a ranger in Sequoia National Park, California, been patrolling these woods since I was old enough to hold a rifle. This ain't no picnic area, it's raw. Untamed wilderness, the kind that can swallow you up if you ain't careful. One crisp morning, I got a radio call about a missing hiker. An older woman, experienced, last seen on a remote trail near Grizzly Peak. Figured she tripped, maybe broke an ankle, standard lost in the woods stuff. I headed out on foot, following her last known route. Hours in, something shifted. The forest got quiet. Too quiet. Birdsong vanished, that usual hum of insects faded. Felt like I'd stepped into a bubble of silence, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Then I came across it, a clearing I'd never seen before, like something big had just trampled through. In the center lay the woman's backpack torn to shreds, her supplies scattered like a coyote got into it. But no blood, no signs of a struggle. That's when the smell hit me. Like rotten meat mixed with a wet dog, unnatural, the kind of stink that sends your stomach churning. My eyes traced enormous footprints sunk deep into the mud, ain't no bear I ever saw made those tracks. 
that's when the fear hit me, I wasn't alone. I radioed for backup, voice shaking some, described what I found. My supervisor told me to sit tight, help was on the way. But a nagging dread was settling in my gut. Whatever made those tracks, it was close, and it was watching me. Suddenly, a low growl caught through the silence. I whirled around, rifle raised. From the tree lean, it emerged, a hulking nightmare that made my blood freeze. This thing stood a good eight feet tall, covered in matted black fur. Its shoulders hunched, powerful arms dragging on the ground. But the face, that's what stuck with me, twisted, almost human, with a long muzzle, teeth like shards of yellowed bone, and eyes that burned with a chilling, hungry intelligence. We locked eyes, a silent standoff across the clearing. It tilted its head, curious, like a dog sizing up a stranger. Then, without warning, it charged. I fired, shots echoing through the trees. One must have grazed it because it snarled, then plowed through the undergrowth, closing the distance with impossible speed. I ran. Straight up panic took over. I tore through the forest, branches whipping against me, my boots slipping on the mossy ground. The thing's roars were getting closer, hot on my heels. I knew I wouldn't make it to the tree lean, not in time. Up ahead, a flicker of hope, an old, gnarled cliff face. I scrambled towards it, heart pounding, the sound of its crashing footsteps like thunder behind me. The creature burst into sight just as I reached the cliff. No time to climb. I lunged to the side, scrambling down a narrow ledge just as the creature swiped at me, its claws tearing at the rock. It roared in frustration, pacing at the base of the cliff. I clung to the ledge, rain starting to fall, my hands slick with sweat and fear. I was trapped. The thing kept circling, looking for a way up the sheer rock face. My muscles screamed my grip weakening. I glanced down, knowing one slip would be fatal. Just when I thought I couldn't hold on any longer, I heard a shout from above. Forrester! Hold on! My fellow rangers had arrived. Gunshots rang out, distracting the creature. It looked up, snarling, then bolted back into the cover of the trees. Taking advantage, the others hauled me up with a rope, just as my fingers gave out. Exhaustion hit me like a ton of bricks, my legs turned to jelly. As the rangers tended to my cuts and strained limbs, we recounted the event, our voices shaky. Back at HQ, we filed the report. Nobody believed my description, of course. Dismissed it as a bear attack, me rattled by the situation. They quietly reassigned me to desk duty while I recovered. I tried to move on, pretend it never happened. But that thing, those eyes, they haunt my nightmares. Left the job soon after, couldn't bear to be in those woods no more. Took up carpentry, try to build things instead of patrol them. Sometimes, late at night, I see movement in the shadows at the edge of my yard. My hand drifts toward the toolbox, where I keep an old rifle stashed. I tell myself it's just deer, or my mind playing tricks. But deep down, I know better. Sequoia is a big park, stretches of it as wild as the day they were born. Folks disappear out there every year, hikers, hunters, the occasional poacher. Vanished without a trace. I used to think it was accidents, getting lost, animal attacks. Now, I ain't so sure. There's things lurking in those woods, 
things that defy explanation. Some secrets are better left buried, some corners of the wild better left untouched. I learned that the hard way. Now, the city feels a bit crowded, but a lot safer. If at night, I catch a whiff of something musky and rotten on the breeze, I close my eyes real tight, try to pretend that it's just my imagination. But I can never forget the feel of that cliff ledge beneath my trembling hands, or the echo of those bone-chilling roars fading into the trees. That encounter changed me. It was like a crack had opened up in my world, exposing a hidden layer of darkness. I tried to drink it away, spent long nights in dingy bars, the stench of stale beer and whiskey a poor substitute for that wild forest musk that haunted my nightmares. It didn't work. I got edgy, quick-tempered, the kind of guy who flinches at every unexpected sound. My marriage crumbled, wife and son leaving with scared, confused eyes. I didn't blame them. One booze-soaked night, I stumbled across a ragged tabloid in the corner store. Headlines screamed, Bigfoot sighting in California. The blurry photo made my heart lurch, that same hulking form, that inhuman face. Underneath, a grainy eyewitness sketch of a monstrous creature, and a name, the Redwood Ripper. The article was pure trash but it sparked something in me. A mix of fear, anger, and a desperate need to prove I wasn't crazy. I knew those old stories, whispers passed. Around campfires about strange sightings in the park. I also knew the official dismissals, animal misidentification, hoaxes, overactive imaginations. But I'd seen it. I knew what was out there. With the recklessness of a man who'd already lost everything, I cashed out my savings, bought some gear, a high-powered rifle, a rugged camera, heavy-duty traps. I rented an isolated cabin on the edge of Sequoia and started my own obsessive hunt. Weeks turned into months. I hiked trails no sane person would venture alone setting up my traps, cameras always at the ready. Nothing. No tracks, no sightings, just the oppressive silence of the forest. Doubts gnawed at me. Was I chasing a phantom, driven mad by grief and trauma? One evening, as I trudged back to my cabin, empty-handed, something caught my eye. A flash of movement in the trees up ahead. Dropping into a crouch, I moved closer, rifle raised, every sense screaming. There, on the edge of a clearing, illuminated by the last rays of the setting sun, stood a family of them, the big male, a female slightly smaller, and two, cubs. My breath hitched in my throat. They seemed almost oblivious to me, the adults foraging, the cubs roughhousing. A part of me, a long-buried part, felt a pang of wonder, a primal fascination with these creatures so far outside the realm of the known. Then the male looked up, those yellow eyes locking with mine. A jolt of terror shot through me. My finger tightened on the trigger, a year's worth of fear and fury demanding release. But as I stared into those eyes... I saw something flicker, recognition, perhaps even a hint of weary defiance. He wasn't just a monster, he was a creature defending his home, his family. I lowered the rifle, the world spinning around me. I couldn't do it. Couldn't pull the trigger. The male watched me for a long moment, then turned back to his foraging, the family moving deeper into the woods. I stumbled back to the cabin, body trembling, my world shattered once again. The next morning, I started dismantling my traps, packing up my gear. It was time to leave. 
I drove straight to the nearest ranger station, walked inside, and told them everything, the creature, my hunt, the family at the clearing. They stared at me, a mix of pity and disbelief in their eyes. I didn't care. Let them think I was a lunatic, another broken man swallowed by the wilderness. Before leaving, I handed the head ranger a chipped memory card. For my camera, I said. If those creatures really exist, someone should know. Someone needs to protect them. He took the card, his expression unreadable. And then I walked away. News reports surfaced a week later. Grainy camera footage showing a monstrous, ape-like figure, sightings by hikers, whispers of the Redwood Ripper echoing through the forests again. The scientific community scoffed, investigations were launched, the park became a circus of cryptozoologists and thrill-seekers. None of them found anything conclusive, of course. The reports eventually faded, replaced by the next newsworthy oddity. But I know the truth. I live in a small coastal town now, thousands of miles away from those dark woods. I work construction, keep to myself. Most nights, sleep comes easy, the ocean waves lulling me into a dreamless rest. But sometimes, I jolt awake, the musky animals stink thick in my nostrils. I see those eyes burning in the darkness, both accusing and pleading. And then I remember the cubs, playing in the fading sunlight, oblivious to the danger their very existence posed. That ranger, sometimes I wonder if he really trashed that memory card. Maybe, in some dusty evidence locker, proof exists. Or maybe, deep in the heart of Sequoia, there's a hidden clearing where a monstrous family roams free, unaware of the world that dismisses them, the world they barely survived. And me? I'm a ghost, a man who saw something he shouldn't have, and lived to regret it. I'll spend the rest of my days with that regret, and the lingering question, did I do the right thing? In a world that demands explanations, sometimes the greatest truths must remain hidden in the shadows, born as a solitary burden. My name is Elias Burrell, and this happened to me back in the summer of 2012. I worked as a fire lookout in Oregon's Deschutes National Forest keeping a watchful eye over a vast expanse of wilderness. Life there was usually quiet, with only the rhythm of the seasons and the chatter of birds to break the silence. But that summer, something changed. It started with whispers among other rangers and locals, sightings of an unusually large animal, fleeting glimpses deep in the woods, a growing sense that the forest had grown darker less welcoming. It wasn't long before the stories reached my fire tower too. Out in the woods, in a remote corner of my patrol area, I found a campsite ripped to shreds. The smell of rotten meat hung heavy in the air, along with that unnatural musky scent that prickled the back of my neck. Massive, unidentifiable footprints gouged the earth and the sight of them sent a chill down my spine. I tried to brush it off as a bear, even one monstrously large. Yet deep down, a primal sense of unease had taken root. I started seeing fleeting shadows at the edge of my vision, hearing growls that were far too guttural to belong to any animal I knew. In one crisp evening, as the sun painted the sky in streaks of gold and orange, I saw it. Crouched on a distant ridge, outlined against the fading light, was a silhouette that sent a jolt of icy fear through me. It was bigger than any bear, its hunched shape vaguely human yet monstrously distorted. For one heart-stopping moment, 
it turned its massive head and our eyes met across the vast distance. Its gaze burned with a cold, unnatural light that felt predatory, almost calculating. Then, with unsettling grace, it disappeared back into the twilight-shrouded trees. After that, sleep became a stranger. Every creaking floorboard in the tower, every rustling leaf outside my window sounded like the creature creeping closer. Yet, reports filed to my superiors were met with dismissive chuckles, attributed to the stress of isolation. No help was coming. I knew I was on my own, alone in this wilderness game of hide-and-seek with an unseen hunter. Weeks passed in a blur of tense patrols and sleepless nights. I armed myself not just with my service rifle, but with every bit of hunter's knowledge I'd gained growing up in the backwoods. If you couldn't reason with it, couldn't outrun it, maybe, just maybe, you could outsmart it. And so, I started laying traps, simple snares meant to catch an animal, anything to prove to myself and anyone who might find them that this wasn't some figment of my overworked imagination. I awoke one morning to the sound that had haunted my nightmares, a low, menacing growl coming from below the tower. Scrambling to the railing, I saw a sight that made my blood run cold. Snared at the base of the tower was a monstrous paw, bigger than my torso. Attached to it were thick, clawed, vaguely human-looking feet covered in dark, coarse hair. It thrashed and roared, and the steel cables of my trap sang under the strain. Then, it looked up. I met those burning yellow eyes and knew with chilling certainty, this was the creature from the ridge, the thing that had stalked my nightmares. And now, it had tracked me down. I fired my rifle, more in desperation than hope. The shots cracked through the air, sending echoes across the valley, and it flinched but didn't fall. The snare finally snapped under the creature's immense strength, and it retreated into the woods with my trap still locked around its monstrous ankle. The paw had been freshly severed, a gruesome trophy I knew was just a taste of the horror to come. That was the turning point. I couldn't stay, not in that isolated tower now marked for the creature's vengeance. I abandoned my post, packed my meager belongings, and hitched a ride to the nearest town, disappearing into backroads and bus routes with a single-minded determination to stay one step ahead of whatever lurked in the depths of the Deschutes. The creature became my obsession. I studied every scrap of lore, every report of similar encounters. They stretched back centuries, Native American legends, fur trappers' tales whispered around flickering campfires, sightings by modern-day hikers and hunters quickly dismissed as hoaxes. They painted a picture of a predator older than written records, a cunning creature that thrived in the shadows on the edges of human knowledge. Did I ever fully escape it? I can't say. The world is vast, cities loud enough to sometimes drown out the howling wind and the creeping fear that makes me flinch at every unexpected shadow. But some nights, when the fog hangs heavy and the sounds of the city fade into the distance, I hear a low, rumbling growl echoing down deserted streets. And on those nights, I know. Deep down, the hunt is far from over. Perhaps, in its own monstrous way, the creature won. Maybe I was one of its trophies too, a survivor to carry its terrifying tale out into a world that will never fully believe me. And as I turn my back to the darkness, rifle clutched tightly in my hands, I wonder if my escape was all part of a much larger, crueler game I'm still destined to lose. Years passed in a restless blur. I moved constantly, unable to settle for long, always on the edge of flight. 
Each strange noise, each rustle in the bushes sent me spiraling back into the paranoia and desperation of those months alone in the Deschutes wilderness. I worked menial jobs, kept my head down and my existence off the grid for fear of drawing both the creature's notice and the attention of those shadowy government men still searching for their prized specimen. Then, a pattern started to emerge. Hikers disappearing in national parks, campers gone missing from remote locations, their ravaged campsites painted with the same horrifying clues, the unnatural stench, the enormous footprints. News reports dismissed it as an uptick in bear attacks or attributed the cases to isolated instances of tragic accidents in unforgiving wilderness. People vanish in the wild, it's a sad fact of life, the dismissive anchors said with practiced sympathy. But I knew the truth lurking behind the well-crafted PR spin. The creature, or perhaps one of its kind, was moving, hunting, growing bolder. And in every victim, I saw glimpses of my own potential fate, a gruesome ending to a life lived in the shadows a cautionary tale reduced to a forgotten statistic. Guilt gnawed at me. Each new disappearance spurred me to action despite the danger. I couldn't save those already lost, but maybe, just maybe, I could prevent another death, another innocent life thrown to appease the ravenous hunger of the monster I knew was real. I became a ghost haunting the backwoods trails and internet forums where rumors of strange sightings and unexplained occurrences buzzed like angry wasps. I tracked the disappearances, looking for connections and patterns only I, with my cursed knowledge, could decipher. And eventually, a lead emerged, a whisper of something seen in the remote peaks of Montana's Glacier National Park. It was a fool's errand. I knew. Armed with an old hunting rifle and the desperate hope I hadn't yet fully surrendered, I trekked into Glacier's unforgiving embrace, alone against the odds and the immensity of the wilderness. I followed faint trails, studied shredded trees and half-eaten carcasses, the creature's monstrous calling card painted with the blood and viscera of the unfortunate. My obsession fueled me as much as it terrified me. Then, high on a snow-covered mountain pass, I stumbled upon a cave, wide, dark, and chillingly still. The acrid tang of rot and ancient decay hung heavy in the air, the very smell of death itself. I approached with a grim sense of finality, this was where the trail ended, for me or for the creature. I moved into the darkness, the beam of my flashlight a pathetic, trembling weapon against the yawning vastness of the cave. Moisture dripped from the ceiling, echoing with ominous finality. The further I went, the more the evidence mounted, scattered bones, not animal but undeniably human, picked clean by something with a cruel taste for marrow. And at the cave's heart, I found it. Huddled in the darkness, its hunched form larger than I could have imagined, was the creature. It was asleep, or at least dormant, its foul breath rising and falling in a guttural rhythm that pulsed through my skull. Even in sleep, it radiated menace. Its pelt was filthy and matted. The monstrous, severed paw with a rusted ring of my trap still dangling was unmistakable proof of its identity. My identity as its prey. For one insane moment, the primal core of me screamed for revenge. This was it, a chance to end the terror, the desperate flight fueled by its existence. I raised my rifle, finger hovering over the trigger. Then, I hesitated. There was something almost unbearably sad about it, alone in its fetid den, surrounded by the grim remnants of its existence. It was a monster, a hunter, yet it was also a living thing bound by the same brutal laws of survival that govern the wilds. 
and who was I, with my own history of survival against the odds, to deliver judgment from the barrel of a gun? Slowly, carefully, I lowered the rifle. Retreating back into the fading light, I blocked the cave entrance as best I could, a futile token against the creature's strength, yet one driven by a sliver of misguided hope that this would give it pause. That maybe it would find a different territory, different prey, causing enough confusion to throw the authorities off its trail long enough for me to vanish for good. In the years that followed, reports of similar disappearances ebbed and flowed, no longer clustered in ways I could track. I told myself I'd done what I could. Had bought time, disrupted the pattern, thrown a lifeline of doubt into the official narrative. I tried to rebuild my life, to find some semblance of peace in the remote corners of Canada, far from the forests of my nightmares. But there are some ghosts you can never escape. Even surrounded by the icy beauty of the Yukon, there are nights when the wind carries a sound that's not quite the wind, a low growl that sets my teeth on edge. I see yellow eyes reflected in the campfire's dancing flames, feel an oppressive weight on my chest as I awake in a cold sweat from a dream of the Deschutes fire tower and the creature's severed paw. And in the lonely quiet of a long winter's night, I wonder if my mercy in that cavern all those years ago was a noble act, or a monstrously selfish one that doomed countless others to a fate I may have once been able to prevent. The news reports continue isolated disappearances with no trace, cases quickly going cold, the wilderness swallowing its secrets whole. And with each headline, each vanished face staring lifelessly from a search poster, a little piece of me dies, replaced by the desolate certainty that the world is far darker, far more dangerous than we care to admit. There are predators, and then there are monsters and sometimes the most terrifying kind walk on two legs, hiding their monstrous nature behind the facade of civilization. My name is Thaddeus Thorne, and this happened to me back in the fall of 97. I work for the Forest Service, up in the Pacific Northwest near the Cascade Range. It's rugged country, old-growth forests thick with ferns and moss, where sunlight barely filters down to the forest floor. Out in the woods, amidst the towering trees, I found a campsite ripped to shreds, not by animals, but something calculated. The tent canvas lay in tangled strips, food supplies were deliberately scattered, not ransacked and the ground was churned with footprints unlike anything I'd ever seen. They were massive, larger than any bare print, with long, raking claws that gouged deep into the earth. In the smell, it hung heavy in the air, an acrid mix of copper and rot. Whatever left those tracks, it wasn't natural. Back at the ranger station, no one believed me. Old Mac grizzled and with decades in these woods under his belt, chuckled and told me to lay off the moonshine. But I knew what I saw. The other rangers gave me sympathetic looks, an unspoken agreement that the rookie was getting spooked by shadows. A week later, two hikers went missing on a remote trail in the area. Search and rescue teams scoured the woods, but found nothing. Then. The same thing happened again, another abandoned campsite, those same monstrous footprints, and two more people vanished into thin air. The disappearances sent a chill through the community. Even the old-timers had to admit something was out there, something unknown and dangerous. I volunteered for the next search operation, fueled by a mix of dread and determination. As I trekked deeper into the dense woodland, a sense of being watched settled over me like a suffocating blanket. The forest, usually so familiar, felt hostile. 
Mac was right about one thing. I was a damn fool for coming out here alone. Then, I saw it, a hulking silhouette moving between the trees. It was immense, easily twice the size of a man, its dark form barely visible in the dim light. My heart slammed against my ribs. Moving cautiously, rifle at the ready, I followed. I knew better than to call out, to reveal my presence to whatever that thing was. It led me deeper into the wilderness, the footprints growing larger with each step. I finally lost sight of it on a rocky outcrop. Cursing, I surveyed the area, searching for any sign of the vanished hikers, or their remains. And then I found something, a flicker of red peeking from under a moss-covered rock. My stomach clenched. It was a scrap of a hiker's flannel shirt, the one the missing woman had been photographed wearing. Blood was smeared across the faded fabric. A wave of nausea washed over me, the reality of what I was up against crashing in with brutal clarity. These weren't accidents, these weren't bear attacks. There was a predator out here, and it was picking people off one by one. Back at the station, News of my discovery silenced the doubts. The seasoned rangers exchanged grim looks. We organized a larger search party, a manhunt now, for both the missing and whatever was taking them. Mac insisted on coming with me, his weathered face etched with grim determination. It took two days to track the creature. Fresh footprints, those monstrous tracks I'd grown to dread, marked a path. We found half-eaten animal carcasses along the way, deer ripped apart with horrifying savagery. Whatever was out there was powerful, and it was hungry. Night was falling when we stumbled upon its lair, a cave hidden amidst the dense undergrowth. The stench wafting from its entrance made me gag a foul mix of blood and rotting meat. Bones littered the cave mouth, some animal, some chillingly human. A primal surge of terror rippled through me. We'd found more than just a missing person case. We need backup, I whispered to Mac, my voice barely audible over the roaring in my ears. Whatever's in there, it isn't natural. Mac nodded a flicker of unease finally visible in his hardened gaze. Carefully, silently, we retreated, moving under the cover of darkness back towards the ranger station. We'd reached the main trailhead when a blood-curdling roar tore through the night, echoing off the surrounding hills. It was unlike any sound I'd ever heard, a mix of fury and a chilling, predatory hunger. We were no longer the hunters. We were the prey. Mac and I ran, stumbling through the underbrush. We could hear it crashing through the trees in pursuit, the thud of its heavy footfalls growing closer with each passing second. A fallen log blocked our path. As we scrambled over it, I heard Mac cry out in pain. I spun, rifle raised. Mac was on the ground, clutching his leg. The creature emerged from the shadows, a monstrous silhouette outlined by the fading moonlight. It was far bigger than I first imagined, covered in thick, matted fur that seemed to absorb the darkness itself. Its eyes glowed a fiery amber, its mouth agape to reveal rows of razor-sharp teeth. Mac screamed pushing me aside with surprising strength. Go, Thad. Go. I hesitated, my finger trembling on the trigger. Mac was as good as dead. But he'd saved my life, and damn it, I wasn't leaving him to be torn apart by that beast. Then, the creature charged. It moved with a speed that defied its immense size covering the ground between us in a matter of blinks. I fired, more out of desperation than hope. 
The shots echoed through the trees, but the thing didn't slow, didn't even seem to notice the bullets. Max screamed again, a choked gurgle of pain. Panic fueling me, I abandoned my rifle and hauled Mac to his feet. He leaned heavily against me, his face pale. We stumbled onward, half running, half dragging ourselves through the underbrush. Behind us, the creature roared, its rage a tangible force that spurred us on. We burst through the treeline, the lights of the ranger station flickering a short distance away. A flicker of hope ignited within me. We might just make it. Just a bit further, and we'd have backup, a fighting chance. Then, Mac tripped on an exposed root, sending us both tumbling to the ground. The creature was upon us in seconds. I rolled, scrambled to my feet. Mac wasn't getting up. He lay sprawled on the ground his eyes wide with terror. The creature stalked toward him, its low growl rippling through the air. In my mind, I saw its jaws closing over his throat, heard the snap of his bones. Blind, desperate fury surged through me. I charged, not with my rifle, I didn't even have time to think about it, but with my bare hands. I slammed into the creature's side with the force of a runaway train. It turned, startled by the unexpected assault. I lunged for its head, my fingers sinking into coarse fur. And I screamed, a primal roar fueled by grief and rage. The creature bellowed, more in surprise than pain. It batted me away like I was nothing more than an irritating fly. I flew backward, slamming into a tree trunk that knocked the breath from my lungs. My vision swam, the creature looming over me, ready to deliver the killing blow. Then a gunshot shattered the night. And another. The beast staggered, its immense body momentarily thrown off balance. More shots rang out, a chorus of pops from the direction of the ranger station. I scrambled back, my body protesting with every movement. More rangers, alerted by the gunfire, must have arrived. The creature spun, its eyes blazing with fury. Facing the new threat, it momentarily forgot about me. I seized the opportunity. Lunging forward, I scooped up my abandoned rifle, praying the impact hadn't damaged it. Taking aim, I squeezed the trigger, pouring what felt like the last of my strength into the shot. The bullet struck the creature in the shoulder, eliciting a roar that shook the ground beneath my feet. Enraged, it turned to charge at the rangers. A hailstorm of bullets met its onslaught. It stumbled, faltered, but still it kept going an unstoppable force driven by fury and primal hunger. Then, with a final, shuddering bellow, it collapsed. Its massive form crashed to the ground, kicking up a cloud of dust and dry leaves. I stared in numb disbelief. It was over. Relief washed over me, swiftly followed by crushing exhaustion and a wave of bone-deep horror. Mac was gone, torn apart before my very eyes. Other rangers, there would be casualties. The beast had been wounded, that was all. We'd won a battle, but not the war. They found more remains in the cave. Too many, a gruesome testament to the creature's reign of terror. The higher-ups covered everything up, of course. Ranger accidents, animal attacks, anything to avoid mass panic. The official reports bore little resemblance to the truth. I left the forest service shortly after. Couldn't look at those trees without seeing monstrous eyes gleaming in the shadows. Moved out east, took up a quiet job in the city. 
It's safer amidst steel and concrete, further away from the dark heart of the wilderness. I try not to think about what else might be out there, lurking in those ancient, forgotten forests. Sometimes I wonder if we even slowed it down, the thing in the cave. Or if it simply retreated, healed its wounds, and lay in wait. The news these days has me on edge, reports of missing persons in the national parks, strange animal attacks. Every time, a chill runs down my spine. I see those glowing eyes, I smell the blood and rot, I hear Max terrified screams. At night, lying awake in my city apartment, I sometimes think I hear the soft thud of heavy footsteps outside my window. Each creak of the floorboards, every rustle of wind through bare trees, sends terror jolting through my veins. I tell myself it's just my imagination, fueled by trauma. But what if it's not? Some nights I dream of the forest, of towering trees, damp moss, and the soft earth beneath my boots. I dream of the creature's cave, the fetid stench and the gleam of bone in the darkness. And in my dream, I hear the echoing roar, closer this time, growing louder with each passing night. Because out there, in the vast untamed wilds, something monstrous still lurks. It hunts, it learns, it adapts. And maybe, just maybe, it remembers. It remembers the scent of the prey that got away. My name is Kaysen Reed, and this happened to me back in the fall of 99. I was a seasonal ranger for the Park Service in Wyoming's remote Wind River Range. It's a land of soaring granite peaks, pristine alpine lakes, and forests of pine that stretch on forever. One crisp morning, while hiking a backcountry trail less frequented by tourists, I stumbled upon a campsite straight out of a nightmare. The small, two-person tent was in shreds, the fabric ripped like tissue paper. Camping gear was scattered everywhere, a sleeping bag hanging half-eaten from a splintered tree branch. Most disturbing of all were the smeared pools of drying blood staining the trampled earth. A wave of nausea washed over me but duty propelled me forward. I scanned the ground, and my heart sank. Enormous footprints marred the dirt, unlike anything I'd ever seen. They were vaguely human in shape but twice the size, with elongated toes ending in razor-sharp claws. That familiar musky scent clung to the air, a rotten, unnatural odor that sent a shiver down my spine. Training dictated that I should retreat and call for backup. But something else, a flicker of reckless curiosity mixed with a sickening sense of dread, made me follow the trail of monstrous footprints instead. They led through dense undergrowth, snapping branches and gouging earth with their savage weight. And as I went deeper into the wilderness, the evidence grew more gruesome. Half-devoured chunks of flesh were snagged on low-hanging branches, the exposed bone glistening sickly white under the dappled sunlight filtering through the leaves. I had to force myself not to vomit, while burning the back of my throat. Whatever those tracks belonged to was big, vicious, and it was still out there. Yet, some morbid fascination kept me moving. When I saw it, I nearly stumbled backwards in shock and horror. It was crouched over a fresh kill, a young elk lying broken and bloody at its feet. The creature was massive, easily eight feet tall at the shoulder when it stood on its hind legs. Its body was covered in a shaggy, matted pelt that looked black in the shadows, and its head was a monstrous, elongated muzzle filled with dagger-like teeth. For a second, it looked up, and our eyes met, mine wide with terror, 
its burning a predatory amber. It let out a low, rumbling growl, a sound that vibrated through my very bones. Then, it dropped to all fours, slinking away from its kill with unexpected grace. My heart pounded in my chest like a frantic drumbeat, and all the survival instincts I didn't know I possessed screamed at me to run. Instead, fueled by a mix of stupidity and rising panic, I did the most dangerous thing I could. I followed it. The creature led me deeper into the wild heart of the Wind Rivers. The trail was clear, its immense weight crushing foliage and leaving deep gashes in the earth. The forest grew denser, the sunlight barely penetrating the thick canopy overhead. My breath came in ragged gasps, and every snap twig sent a surge of adrenaline coursing through me. Twice, I swore I heard it behind me, a low growl or the rustle of disturbed leaves. Yet, when I spun around, rifle raised, there was nothing but the silent press of trees. It was toying with me, I realized, leading me on. And like a fool, I was playing its twisted game. As the shadows began to lengthen and a golden light painted the towering peaks, I reached a high mountain meadow. And there, waiting for me in the center, stood the creature. It sat back on its haunches, forelegs dangling, watching me with a chilling intelligence. In the fading light, it looked less like a wild animal and more like some twisted parody of a man, a hulking, monstrous silhouette spawned from darkness. We faced each other across the clearing, predator and prey locked in a silent standoff. Then, the creature inclined its massive head in what seemed like a mocking gesture, and a guttural chuckle echoed through the meadow, sending a flock of birds scattering from the treetops. I raised my rifle, more out of a primal instinct than any real hope of stopping it if it charged. It moved then, not with an explosive lunge, but with unnerving, deliberate steps that ate up the ground with alarming speed. My mind screamed at me to shoot, to run, but my body was frozen, locked in a battle between instinct and terror. I squeezed my eyes shut, awaiting the claws, the teeth, the crushing blow that would end it all. Yet, the attack never came. When I finally mustered the courage to look, the meadow was empty. The creature had vanished as quickly and silently as it had appeared. Shaking, sick, and more scared than I had ever been in my entire life, I turned and ran. I didn't stop running until I burst through the tree lean and collapsed, panting, back at the trailhead where my truck was parked. Behind me, the vast, unknowable wilderness watched, its secrets held safe. The incident report I filed was long, detailed, and promptly dismissed as the ramblings of a ranger who'd spent too long in isolation. They offered a psych evaluation, which I angrily refused, and a forced leave of absence, which I begrudgingly accepted. But I knew the truth. There were things in the wild no science textbook could explain, monsters lurking in the forgotten corners of the world. And, worst of all, I knew it was now fixated on me. The chase in the woods, the toying in the meadow, it felt personal, some sick game played by a predator with far more time than I had years on this earth. My forced exile felt less like rest and more like a countdown. I started obsessively researching cryptozoology, folk tales, anything that hinted at creatures like the one I encountered. The stories were there, buried in dismissed reports, the hushed campfire tales of seasoned woodsmen, Native American legends of forest spirits gone wrong. None offered answers, but all confirmed what I knew, I wasn't alone in seeing the unexplainable. I tried to rebuild some semblance of life. 
got a part-time job at a sporting goods store, spent my nights drowning my fears in cheap whiskey, and jolting awake in a cold sweat from nightmares where the creature's amber eyes burned in the darkness. I became a familiar, pitted figure among the town's barflies, the crazy ranger with his wild story. But even drunken ramblings can carry a kernel of truth. Word reached the wrong ears. One night, a group of men showed up at my rundown trailer, all dressed in black, smelling of expensive cologne and an air of military efficiency. They claimed to be from a private research organization, interested in my unique wilderness encounter. Their practiced smiles and overly interested questions didn't fool me. Whatever they were, they weren't the good guys. Panic flared anew. If this shadowy organization was sniffing around, the creature wouldn't be far behind. My only chance was to disappear, flee before either party caught up with me. I quit my job, leaving no forwarding address, and gathered what little gear and savings I had. Under the cover of darkness, I fueled up my battered truck and hit the open road, a nomad with a monstrous shadow at my heels. Months passed in a blur of backroads, dingy motels, and a constant, gnawing fear that each rustle in the night meant those eyes were upon me again. I kept one step ahead, moving from state to state, sleeping with one eye open and my rifle loaded. I even tried losing myself in cities for a while, but the concrete jungle couldn't draw the echo of primeval howls in the deepest parts of my mind. I was drawn back to the wilds, even knowing they were my doom. Eventually, I wound up in California's Redwood National Park, a place known for its otherworldly giants and the lingering touch of ancient mysteries. It felt like a fitting final stand. I found an abandoned ranger's cabin deep within the old-growth forest, stocked up on supplies, and fortified the place as best I could under the constant, creeping dread that my time was running out. The creature didn't make me wait long. One moonless night, its blood-curdling howl tore through the silence, closer than I'd ever heard it. The next morning the only sign was a fresh elk carcass half-dragged into the woods near the cabin, and I knew the noose was tightening. For weeks, the siege continued. It never showed itself, but the evidence of its presence was everywhere, mutilated animal remains, my own supplies disappearing when I briefly ventured out, the oppressive feeling of being watched day and night. My nerves frayed to the breaking point, my dreams a chaotic blur of the chase, the meadow, and those burning, predatory eyes. And then, one crisp morning, it began. The cabin creaked under an unseen weight. The flimsy wooden door shuddered under a thunderous impact. My rifle shook in my sweaty hands useless against the raw power on the other side of that splintering wood. Another blow, then another, and the door began to give. Each impact echoed through my body, a countdown clock to my inevitable death. Just before the door finally caved in, I made a desperate decision. I wasn't dying like a cowering animal in this musty cabin. I burst from the back entrance, rifle raised, ready to make a final, futile stand. But the clearing where I expected to see the monstrous form was empty. Only the shredded remains of the cabin door lay in splinters on the forest floor. Confusion mingled with a flicker of hope. Could it have given up, left? Had I finally won this twisted game? I waited, rifle at the ready, heart pounding, for any sign of my tormentor. Silence reigned, broken only by the rustle of leaves in the wind. But then, I heard it, the low chuckle that haunted my waking hours and my darkest nightmares. It wasn't coming from the ruined cabin, 
but from the treeline, from above me. I spun, looking up just as the creature dropped from the branches with a terrifying roar. It landed not ten feet away, its monstrous form blocking out the sliver of sunlight. My rifle fired on instinct, the shots deafening in the enclosed clearing. But it kept coming, unnaturally fast, dodging my desperate attempts to aim. Then, we were upon each other, a tangle of limbs and claws in fury. I fought back with everything I had, using the rifle as a club, my boots finding purchase on its fur-covered flanks. It roared with pain and rage, its yellow eyes blazing inches from my own. And for a brief, mad moment, I believed, insanity fueled by adrenaline and desperation, that maybe, just maybe, I could survive. My name is Ezra Yates, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2009. I live up near the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State, in a small cabin about a mile into the National Forest. It's peaceful most of the time, and I wouldn't trade the quiet for anything. I do logging work for a local company, but they lay off a crew most winters on account of the weather. Freeze up my time to explore, do some hiking when the snow isn't too bad, and a bit of hunting. Late October that year, deeper into the woods than usual, I stumbled across a campsite. A mess of a campsite. Ripped up tent, supplies strewn everywhere, cans of beans, crumpled packages of jerky. Something had clearly ransacked the place. And that's when I saw the footprints. I hunt deer, elk, but these, these tracks were something else. Massive, and I don't mean bear-sized. Each impression was longer than my forearm, with claws like daggers. A cold shiver went down my spine. Some folks up here believe in Bigfoot and all that, but I always figured those were campfire stories to spook tourists. Yet, I couldn't make sense of these tracks whatever left them was huge, powerful. The thought of being hunted by something like that sent a wave of pure, animal fear prickling through me. I snapped some pictures on my phone, shaky ones, with my hands trembling, and backtracked out of there as fast as I could, rifle at the ready. On the way out, I noticed something else odd, no signs of a struggle, no bloodstains. Whatever trashed that camp, it didn't seem to have left its victims behind. That just made things feel unnaturally wrong. The rest of the day was a blur. I barely remember getting back to my truck. The weight of those enormous footprints pressed down on me, and by nightfall, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. I slept fitfully, a loaded shotgun leaning against my bedside. News travels slowly in these parts. When I went into town a few days later, grabbing supplies and some beers at the general store, I mentioned what I found to old man Richards, who runs the place. Figured if anyone knew anything about strange happenings in the woods, it'd be him. His face went pale. He didn't scoff, didn't crack jokes like I expected. Instead, he poured me a double shot of whiskey. Son, he said, his voice low, there's things out there you don't understand. Things most folks would think are tall tales. Tread careful out in those hills. I pushed for stories, but he clammed up, staring out the window with a haunted look I'd never seen on him before. The rest of the town didn't seem none too eager to talk about it either. Whatever I glimpsed out in those woods touched on a collective fear, a shared secret no one wanted to voice out loud. I'm stubborn, though, maybe hard-headed. I couldn't leave it alone. I started doing research, 
missing persons reports, old unsolved cases in the area. Turns out, folks do vanish off the trails from time to time, disappearances shrugged off as accidents after a cursory search. And there were whispers of strange sightings, tales from hunters about hulking figures moving out at the edge of their vision. I started going back out regularly, armed to the teeth and with my senses on high alert. The thought that people, maybe those campers, were victims of whatever left those massive footprints, filled me with a burning anger. If it was an animal, it needed to be put down. If it was something, else, well, I wasn't sure what I'd do, but I couldn't just leave it be. My search wasn't turning up anything. No fresh tracks, no sign of struggle. But the unease gnawed at me, the feeling of being watched growing heavier each time I ventured out. Then, one gray afternoon deep in the tangle of pine and underbrush, I found something. A scrap of faded red nylon snagged on a branch, a torn piece of material matching the shredded tent. A spike of fear shot through me. This was the place, the same place. I moved slow, sweeping the area, rifle raised. Nothing seemed out of place, just the rustle of leaves and the faint chirp of birds. That's when I saw a shadow flicker at the edge of my vision. I spun, heart pounding, but there was nothing. Just a trick of the light, I told myself, a branch swaying. My breath came in short gasps. I knew, then, I was being played with. That first day, whatever it was, it let me see those tracks on purpose, led me here. It was hunting me, just as I was hunting it. I backed away slowly, keeping my eyes peeled, fighting the urge to break into a run. A twig snapped behind me. I whirled around, rifle raised, just as a massive shape burst from the undergrowth a few yards away. For a heart-stopping moment, it was frozen, a silhouette limbed against the fading light. Then it moved, not with the lumbering gait of a bear, but a fluid, terrifying grace. I could make out the sheer bulk of it, the thick muscles rippling under its dark, matted fur. Its face, there's no good way to describe it. It was like a man's face, but warped, stretched into a grotesque parody. And the eyes, those damn eyes, glowing yellow in the dimness, filled with a hunger both animal and chillingly intelligent. I fired almost without thinking, the deafening roar of the gun echoing through the trees. The creature let out a howl, part pain part rage, and staggered back slightly. I took the opportunity and ran like hell, the adrenaline fueling me in a blind sprint through the woods. Shots rang out behind me, and the sound of snapping branches told me it was giving chase. I ran with the desperation of a cornered animal, hurdling fallen logs, tearing through thickets, my heart threatening to explode from the exertion. Then, as if a switch had been flipped, the chase abruptly ceased. The pounding footsteps behind me faded, the snapping of branches died away. An eerie silence descended, broken only by my ragged gasps for air. I stopped, leaning against a massive oak, my hands slick with sweat and fear. Had I lost it? Had it given up the hunt? A wave of relief washed over me, then vanished as quickly as it came. I was out here alone, miles from any road. No cell service, no way to call for help. If I collapsed from exhaustion, if it was simply circling around, waiting, the thought was as chilling as the gathering twilight. I moved carefully, eyes scanning the shadows, rifle poised. Every flicker of movement, every rustle, sent a fresh jolt of panic through me. Then, ahead, a flicker of light through the trees. 
My old logging road, a faint hope of escape. My legs, screaming in protest, carried me toward it. The closer I got, the brighter the light became, until the trees broke open and I found myself staring down at my truck, bathed in the yellow glow of its headlights. Never had the sight of rusted metal and chipped paint been so beautiful. A burst of laughter escaped me, tinged with hysterical relief. I scrambled down the slope and fumbled for my keys, my fingers trembling too badly to get the damn thing into the ignition. Just as the engine coughed to life, a bone-chilling roar ripped through the night. I looked up. It was perched on a rock outcropping overlooking the road, illuminated by the headlights. Massive, powerful, a predator watching its escaped prey. I didn't hesitate, slamming the truck into gear and peeling away with a screech of tires, gravel spraying behind me. Through the rearview mirror, I watched it leap from the rock, its dark shape shrinking into the distance as I sped away. I didn't stop driving until I hit the nearest town, the lights cutting through the thick darkness a beacon of civilization. I found a cheap motel, parked, and sat shaking behind the wheel for a long, long time. In the harsh light of morning, I had to make a decision. I could try to explain it all to the police, the park rangers, face skepticism, pity, maybe even suspicion. The alternative was to vanish, leave everything behind. My life in these woods, the only life I'd really known, was over. Whatever haunted those trees, it wanted me, and I wasn't fool enough to stick around. I left Washington that week. Moved across the country, found a faceless apartment in a crowded city on the East Coast. I took a night watchman job, the loneliness of those quiet hours preferable to the creeping fear of the woods. Yet, even here, surrounded by concrete and streetlights, I haven't escaped the memory of what I saw. In the quiet of the pre-dawn hours, the distant wail of a siren will sometimes make me jump my heart pounding a familiar panicked rhythm. And once, late at night, I stepped out of my apartment for a smoke and swore, just for a moment, that I saw a flicker of those glowing yellow eyes from across the shadowy street. The city's noises quickly washed it away, but the fear lingered long after. The news these days is full of strange reports, even in the cities. People vanishing without a trace, mutilated animal carcasses in the parks, sometimes I wonder if it followed me. Or if there's more than one of those things out there, if they're spreading like some kind of monstrous, relentless plague. Most nights, I try not to think about it. I'll flick on the TV to drown out the silence. But some nights, some nights I hear the crunch of leaves and the low, rumbling growl echoing down the empty street outside my window. It may already be too late. Some part of me knows that one day, I won't wake up from those nightmares. One day, the eyes peering at me from the darkness won't just be a trick of the mind. I know the creature is patient. It let me see it, it let me escape the woods, all part of its twisted game. Maybe it enjoys the hunt more this way, the knowledge that its prey can run but never truly hide. And some nights, a small, rebellious part of me wishes it would just get it over with. I imagine charging into the darkness with that old hunting rifle, knowing it would be futile, but going down fighting, not hiding like a cornered rat. There's a terrible freedom in that thought the idea of meeting my fate head-on. But not yet. Not tonight. Tonight, I turn the television volume a little louder and push the image of those monstrous footprints and glowing eyes far, far back into the recesses of my mind. There's always tomorrow night for courage, 
for facing the monstrous truth that waits in the shadows. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2012. I work as a ranger in Montana, in the Bitterroot National Forest. Lived up here practically my whole life, know these woods like the back of my hand, or so I thought. Deep in the forest, near an old logging trail, I found a campsite ripped to shreds. The tent was a mess of torn canvas, clothes were strewn everywhere, and there were splatters of blood across the ground. It was obvious something went down, and it wasn't pretty. What stood out were the footprints. Massive, human-like, but bigger than any hiker I'd ever met, claws gouging into the soil. My stomach churned. This felt different than a normal bear encounter, the messiness, the blood, those damn footprints. I called it in, requesting backup. Jake, a veteran ranger known for his level-headedness, arrived two hours later, rifle in hand and a frown deepening the lines on his face. We did a sweep of the area, found nothing but the campsite. I showed him the footprints. He didn't scoff or chuckle, just studied them for a long while, an uneasy silence hanging heavy between us. I ain't seen nothing like this before. Jake finally said, his voice low. But we need to find those campers, alive or... He trailed off, neither of us wanting to voice the worst-case scenario. Word about the campsite spread through the ranger station, met with a mix of apprehension and disbelief. We organized a search party, combed through those woods for days. Found nothing, no trace of the campers. No wild animal tracks, just those huge footprints lingering like a haunting reminder. A few weeks later, another report came in, a lone hiker gone missing from a trail a few miles north. More footprints, even bigger than the first ones. Fear rippled through our ranks, whispered rumors now taking on a grim clarity. This wasn't some isolated incident. Whatever was out there was big, smart, and it was hungry. Then, that damned campsite turned up again. We found it, or what was left of it, deeper in the woods than before. This time, there was no denying the horror. The remains of the campers were strewn about, mangled limbs, gnawed bones, their blood soaking the ground in dark, sticky stains. The scene turned my stomach, hardened as I was from years in the woods. Whatever did this, it wasn't simply killing. It was savoring the slaughter. That's when I saw it. Not fully, just a glimpse, a hulking shape disappearing between the trees. It was immense, dark fur rippling over thick muscles, eyes like glowing coals in the twilight. Before I could raise my rifle, it was gone, swallowed by the shadows. That night, back at the station, Jake, the other rangers, and I mapped out the disappearances, the sightings. It painted an ugly picture, the creature was territorial, moving in a slow circle through its hunting ground, growing bolder with each kill. And, if our calculations were right, it was heading straight for the town. The next morning, we organized a hunt. It wasn't official, no paperwork to avoid stirring up unnecessary panic. Just a dozen rangers, armed to the teeth and determined to bring that thing down. We knew this wasn't going to be some standard animal takedown. This was about protecting our town, our families. Setting out at dawn, we followed the fresh tracks. They were massive, each one sinking deep into the earth. The forest was eerily quiet, every rustle a potential threat. Then, as the sun began its descent, casting long shadows, we found our prey. 
It was lying in wait, perched atop a rock overlooking a clearing. It dwarfed any bear I'd ever seen, its fur a matted, inky black. Its eyes, fixated on us, burned an acidic yellow that sent shivers down my spine. The moment it saw us, it sprang from its perch with a speed that defied its bulk. We opened fire, a hail of bullets filling the air. The creature roared, a sound that shook the very ground beneath our feet, but it kept charging, dodging the gunfire with uncanny agility. A ranger named Ben went down first, the creature slashing him across the chest in a blur of claws. The sound of his scream still echoes in my nightmares. Jake fired a shot that struck the creature's shoulder, drawing a spray of black-red blood. It howled, fury burning in its eyes. Then, with terrifying speed, it lunged for him. Jake, bless his soul, didn't flinch. He stood his ground, emptying the rest of his magazine into the beast's chest. The bullets staggered the creature, buying us precious seconds. It stumbled, its massive form momentarily losing balance, and I seized the opportunity. With a yell, I charged forward, my rifle useless without ammunition, nothing but my hunting knife gripped in my sweating hand. I aimed for the head, for distraction, if nothing else. It swiped at me a paw like a tree trunk narrowly missing my torso and sending me sprawling. Scrambling to my feet, I saw another ranger, Sarah, fall as the creature tore into her with sickening, ripping sounds. Ron, Rowan. It was Jake, his voice hoarse. He threw himself at the creature, not aiming to shoot, but to grapple. They crashed to the ground in a tangle of limbs and fury. The creature, distracted, let out a roar that echoed through the trees. I stumbled backward, the world tilting on its axis. We were losing. Even with our numbers, we were no match for its raw, monstrous power. Yet, as I watched Jake disappear under its immense weight, a surge of desperation fueled me. Turning, I ran. Not in fear, not anymore, but because there was one last play we hadn't made. The creature gave chase, the pounding of its feet drumming a heartbeat against my ribs. I burst through the trees, onto the old logging road, barely a few miles from the town. That was the plan, desperate and crazy as it was, to draw it out, away from the rangers away from the innocent folks living their lives in peaceful ignorance just a short distance away. As I ran, the memory of the mangled campsite victims flashed through my mind the torn clothes, the blood-soaked earth. A cold determination hardened within me. It ended here, with me. I ran until my lungs burned, until my legs were screaming in protest. The creature was close, its breath hot on my neck, its monstrous form a looming shadow. But I ran on, towards the clearing ahead. I could see the lights of the town beyond it, a beacon of hope that only further solidified my resolve. Then, I stumbled and fell. The creature was on me in a heartbeat, a mountain of fur and rage. It raised a clawed paw the killing blow imminent, and I closed my eyes, bracing myself for oblivion. But the blow never came. Instead, a deafening screech of metal and the pungent smell of burning rubber filled the air. My eyes flew open. A semi-truck had swerved off the road, smashing its headlights into the beast. The creature staggered under the impact, roaring in surprise and pain. This was my chance. Scrambling backwards, I ran for the tree lean, ignoring the pain of scraped knees and the ragged gasps tearing from my burning lungs. 
I reached the shadows and didn't look back until I was sure the creature had lost sight of me. Only then did I collapse, my body throbbing, my vision swimming with exhaustion. Through the trees, I could see the chaos unfolding. The semi-truck driver, unharmed, had scrambled from the wreckage. Flashlights from the town flickered, the first hesitant responders drawn by the crash. The creature, momentarily disoriented, was now facing a new threat. It lunged at a policeman, its roar echoing through the night. There was a flash of gunfire, then another. They weren't trying to kill it, just driving it back, buying themselves time. I watched as the beast, enraged by this unexpected resistance, turned from the town and retreated deeper into the forest. It took hours to secure the area, to confirm the creature was truly gone. In the end, the tally was grim, Jake and Sarah gone, another ranger wounded. The semi-truck driver was hailed as a hero, his quick thinking preventing unimaginable tragedy. Of the creature, nothing was found beyond a trail of bloodstains disappearing into the undergrowth. Rangers tracked it for days, determined to finish it off, but the trail went cold. As the news crews descended on our small town, the official story became a freak bear attack, injuries exaggerated, the dead rangers victims of an unfortunate accident, their bravery downplayed to avoid panic. I spent months in the hospital recovering from my own injuries. The doctors called it a miracle I survived the encounter. I kept the truth to myself, the story of the monster too unbelievable for anyone but a fellow ranger. They discharged me a changed man, every creak at night, every shadow flitting past my window setting my pulse racing. They offered me a desk job, a quieter life. But the woods, they still call to me. The danger is part of my lifeblood now. I moved to another ranger station, deeper in the wilderness. The disappearances continue, sporadic and brutal. No amount of patrols or warnings seem to stop it. Every footprint on a remote trail, every half-glimpsed shadow sends a familiar chill coursing through me. Nights are the worst. The dreams take me back to that clearing, the screams, the blood, the relentless yellow eyes watching from the darkness. That creature, whatever it is, is still out there. It's bolder now, smarter, evolving. The disappearances happen more frequently, a grim reminder that the quiet moments are only a prelude to the next bloody rampage. The wilderness, once a place of solace, is now a vast, untamed hunting ground. Each rustle of the wind, every snap of a twig, carries an echo of the monstrous thing lurking unseen. And I can't shake the feeling that one day, when I head out on patrol, I may not come back. My name's Rowan Kane, and this happened to me back in 2010. I spent most of my adult life working for the Forest Service up in Montana's Bob Marshall Wilderness. It's a million plus acres of mountain peaks, thick pine forests, and rivers that still run clear as glass. The kind of place that makes you feel both insignificant and completely at peace, all at the same time. While out on patrol, I came across a campsite that had seen far better days. The tent was shredded, supplies tossed about like a whirlwind had gone through and the fire pit was still smoldering. There was a lingering smell in the air too, musky and sweet, with a sharp, metallic tang that prickled the back of my throat. No bear I'd ever encountered smelled like that. Worse than the smell were the footprints. Massive things, bigger than my own size twelves. They looked vaguely human, 
with clawed toes gouging deep into the soft earth. Whatever left those tracks, it was big, and it was long gone. But the sight of them sent an uneasy shiver down my spine. I radioed it in, standard procedure, then started following the trail out of curiosity, and maybe a morbid sore of fascination. They led deeper into the woods, away from the main trails. The undergrowth was thick, progress slow. I kept my rifle at the ready, senses on high alert. Each snap of a twig made me jump, and I kept seeing flickers of movement at the edge of my vision. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I knew I wasn't alone. Something was out there, watching me from the deepening gloom. Finally, as dusk settled in, I saw it. Crouched on a boulder, outlined against the fading light, was a creature that sent a surge of cold dread through me. It was immense, taller than any man, with broad shoulders rippling with muscle underneath its dark, coarse fur. Its head was like a monstrous hybrid of human and wolf, with a long muzzle filled with a mouthful of gleaming fangs. Its eyes burned with a chilling yellow light, focused on me with unnerving intelligence. Fear jolted me into action. I raised my rifle and fired, more out of desperation than hope of hitting my target. The shots echoed through the trees, and the creature reacted, not with a cry of pain, but with a guttural roar of fury. For one long, terrible moment, we locked eyes across the clearing, predator and prey sizing each other up. Then, it was gone, disappearing into the undergrowth with an unnatural swiftness, its massive form melting into the shadows. I waited, rifle at the ready, heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. But the only sound was the rustle of leaves and the distant hoot of an owl. The creature left no trace, only the lingering fear in my gut that it was still out there, watching, waiting. Back at base camp, my report was met with disbelieving stares. Old Chuck, a grizzled veteran, chuckled and told me to lay off the moonshine. But I knew what I saw. The others were too used to predictable bears and careless campers to entertain the idea of something that didn't fit neatly into their worldview. So, I learned to keep my mouth shut and my eyes open. Months passed. The footprints of that night faded from memory, replaced by the rhythm of patrols and the familiar sights of my territory. Then, one crisp autumn morning, a rancher on the edge of the wilderness called it in, his livestock mutilated in the night, and massive tracks leading into the trees. The sheriff organized a hunting party. They asked for my expertise tracking in the wilderness, and I should have said no. Should have pretended I hadn't seen a damn thing out of the ordinary in all my years. But guilt gnawed at me for not raising the alarm sooner and the sight of the rancher's devastated face, tears mingling with the dust on his cheeks, made my decision for me. Armed with rifles and grim determination, we followed the tracks. They painted an ugly picture, a predator with terrifying cunning, stalking the forest under the cover of darkness. We found more gruesomely ravaged livestock, their remains half-eaten like something was saving them for later. We were hunting a monster that didn't just kill for food, but seemed to take a terrible kind of pleasure in it. By the time the sun began its descent, we were forced to make camp. The forest at night held a new kind of menace, every creak and groan amplified in the unnatural silence that settled over us. We built a roaring fire its flickering light holding back the encroaching shadows. I was on watch when I heard it, the low, guttural growl emanating from the thick darkness just outside our circle of light. 
A chill ran down my spine. It was out there, watching us. My warnings to the others were met with skepticism, dismissed as the nerves of a man who'd spent too long in the isolation of the woods. But then it attacked. It came out of nowhere, a blur of muscle and fur and rage. One second, the trees looming silent and still, the next, a nightmare unleashed. Before anyone could properly react, the creature was in our midst, knocking aside a camp chair like it was a child's toy. Gunfire erupted, the sound deafening in the still night air. The monster stumbled, a spray of inky blood flying, but kept coming. It was built like a living tank, bullets that would stop a bear barely seeming to slow it down. Pete, one of the ranchers, was its first victim. It was on him in a blink, teeth and claws flashing. Pete screamed, a horrible, choked sound cut short as the creature tore into his side. Frantically, I fired at it, emptying my rifle into its massive torso. It roared, a deafening sound that rattled the very bones in my body. Yet, it was still on its feet, fury twisting its monstrous features. More screams filled the night as the creature carved a path of chaos through our campsite. In the flickering firelight, I saw flashes of blood and shredded clothing. Then, it turned those blazing yellow eyes on me. I stumbled backward, losing my footing and landing hard, my rifle flying out of my hands. The creature stalked toward me, its pace purposeful. This was it. This was how I died, alone in the dark heart of the woods, another gruesome offering to the creature in the shadows. Terror and resignation warred within me, a desperate scramble of emotions that left me frozen in place. Just as the creature lunged, a gunshot roared to my right. Ben, another rancher, had found his courage, his rifle trained on the creature's massive head. It was enough of a distraction. The creature faltered, its yellow eyes flicking towards Ben with calculating malice. That paw saved my life. Scrambling to my feet, I lunged for my dropped rifle. As the creature turned fully toward this new threat, I took aim and fired. One shot, two, the recoil jarring my shoulder. One of my shots struck the creature in the face, a lucky strike. It roared again, this time a scream filled with pain. The creature staggered, and Ben took his chance, pouring another volley of frenzied shots into its massive body. With a final, shuddering gasp, the creature collapsed to the ground, its once terrifying form going still. Silence descended, broken only by the ragged breathing of the survivors and the low crackle of the dying fire. In the first light of dawn, we surveyed the carnage. Blood soaked the ground, our campsite looked like a war zone, and Pete lay broken and unmoving amidst the tattered remains of his tent. The creature's corpse was close by, the sickly sweet scent of its blood heavy in the air. Even in death, it was terrifying. Its sheer size, the ragged fur, the clawed feet the size of dinner plates, these were images seared into my brain. We called it in, of course. More teams with fancy equipment descended. Biologists took samples, the military asked questions nobody could answer, and a heavy veil of secrecy fell over the whole thing. In the end, it was covered up. Attacks attributed to bears, sightings dismissed as hoaxes. They even dragged the creature's body away, citing ecological concerns, leaving no trace of the horror we knew was real. I returned to my work in the wilderness, but it was never the same. That primeval fear had sunk deep into my bones. 
Each patrol, I saw those burning yellow eyes in the shadows, heard the blood-curdling roar echoing in the wind. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore. I took early retirement, moved down south to a small, sun-drenched town by the ocean. Far removed from the whispering pines and the looming shadows. But some nights, when the fog rolls in thick and the mournful cry of the gulls sounds like a creature's distant howl, the nightmares return with crystal-clear intensity. I'll wake up in a cold sweat, my pulse racing, the image of Pete's broken body branded on the insides of my eyelids. The townsfolk here, with their beach barbecues and concerns about the weekend weather forecast, wouldn't understand. They haven't looked into the primeval heart of the wild and seen the true monsters that lurk there, just beyond their well-lit, complacent reality. I try to keep busy. Gardening, volunteering at the local library, anything to distract myself from the gnawing fear that the creatures are still out there, multiplying, learning from their mistakes. Out in the Bob Marshall wilderness, something monstrous still stirs. The locals tell stories of mutilated livestock, missing hunters, strange, guttural calls carried on the wind. They are dismissed as legend, tall tales told to entertain tourists around crackling campfires. A chill runs through me whenever I hear those accounts, a visceral certainty that they're ringing far too true. For I know, deep down, that the wilderness will always harbor a darkness the civilized world refuses to acknowledge. And someday, inevitably, that darkness will rise again, a gruesome reminder that nature's most terrifying secrets aren't found in any field guide or textbook. It's a brutal truth I learned the hard way, a truth that will haunt me to my dying day. My name is Kaysen Reed, and this happened to me back in the fall of 99. I live in a small town on the edge of the Ozark National Forest. Quiet place, mostly. I do a bit of forestry work, some part-time logging when there's a crew to run. Back then, I was still a young guy eager for adventure, and the woods were always calling to me. Deep in the forest, Near an old creek bed, I stumbled upon a campsite straight out of a nightmare. The tent was shredded, looked like it had been torn apart by claws rather than teeth, and supplies were scattered everywhere. And the smell, that hit me first. Like rotting meat mixed with something sharp and metallic, an odor I'd never encountered before. I saw the tracks then. Massive prints pressed deep into the mud, wider than any bear I'd ever seen. My heart pounded against my ribs. Something dangerous had been there, something powerful. I edged back slowly, keeping an eye on the tree lean. But it was dead silent, nothing stirred in the thick underbrush. Back in town, I headed straight to Earl's the old-timers diner with bad coffee and even better gossip. Told them what I found, expecting the usual jokes and disbelief. But Earl just got that serious look he sometimes wore, and a couple of the old hunters exchanged uneasy glances. Turns out, those strange footprints weren't a new thing. Folks had been whispering about them for years. Hunters finding half-eaten deer carcasses, hikers seeing a huge dark shape move at the edge of their vision, just glimpses out of the corner of an eye. We all knew there were cougars in these hills, even grizzlies wandered down from Montana from time to time. But this, this was different. Something about those enormous tracks felt wrong. Some of the townies called it a hoax. A tall tale spun too many times. Others muttered about Bigfoot. It just seemed too outlandish, even for these parts. Me, I'm a see-it-to-believe-it kind of guy. 
So, a week later, armed with a rifle and a stubborn determination I now sort of regret, I headed back out, alone. Found the campsite again, untouched since I first stumbled upon it. This time, I pushed deeper into the woods, following a faint trail of those massive footprints. They led me through brambles and thickets, further than I'd ever ventured on my own. I kept expecting those tracks to disappear, for the whole thing to feel like a sick joke, but they went on and on. The sun began to dip low, casting long shadows that danced with the swaying branches. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end. I knew I should turn back, that venturing into those woods after dusk was plain idiotic, but there was a kind of fascination mixed in with the fear, a morbid curiosity. It was nearly dark when I found the clearing. It looked like a tornado had ripped through it, trees were snapped and uprooted, the ground churned to mud. And in the center, there was a pile of something. At first, I couldn't make it out, the fading light made it all a blurry mess. Then, as I cautiously approached, a wave of nausea nearly buckled my knees. It was the campsite's owners, or what was left of them. Their bodies were torn apart, broken like twigs. There was so much blood soaked into the earth and splattered across the shredded remains of their tent. The stench was unbearable, a mix of iron and decay and something foul I couldn't place. That's when I saw it. At the edge of the clearing, half hidden in the shadows, was a massive shape. It was crouched low, but as it slowly straightened, it stood taller than any man, its silhouette impossibly wide. I couldn't make out details, just the bulk of it, like pure muscle layered over a monstrous frame, and eyes that glowed a fiery yellow in the deepening twilight. A low growl rumbled from its chest, echoing through the clearing. That snapped me out of my frozen horror. I turned and ran, tearing through the woods in a blind panic, branches whipping my face. I could hear the creature give chase, the crashing of its powerful strides through the brush growing closer. My breath burned in my lungs, and the scream of fear caught in my throat was deafening even over the pounding of its pursuit. Then I tripped, tumbled down a slope, and slammed into a tree trunk. My rifle was lost somewhere in the undergrowth. Pain exploded in my ankle twisting me into a whimpering heap. Despair washed over me. I was cornered, the creature would be on me in seconds. It loomed out of the darkness a heartbeat later, its eyes blazing. It was crouched now, mere feet away, and I got my first clear look at it. It looked human, but warped into a grotesque mockery. Its skin was dark, nearly black, and leathery. Its face was stretched and elongated, and its teeth were long, needle-sharp things crowding a gaping maw. It let out another growl that reverberated through my body, a primal declaration of imminent death. My mind flooded with the rumors I'd dismissed as foolish, the half-eaten carcasses, the glimpses of hulking figures, all those tales written off as exaggeration. Those were warnings. This, this was the nightmare those whispers alluded to. There was no time to process the sheer impossibility of it all. The creature lunged, a blur of darkness. Instinctively, I threw up my arm, a futile shield against the claws that raked towards me. Agony exploded in my shoulder, a searing pain that lanced through me momentarily eclipsing the terror. When I regained my senses, the world tilted on its axis. It was lying atop me, its immense weight crushing me into the earth. Its fetid breath washed over my face, a hot wave that carried the stench of the grave. Its eyes, inches from mine, 
burned with the savage satisfaction of a predator that had cornered its prey. I knew this was it, the end. I squeezed my eyes shut, awaiting the blow that would end my life. But the blow never came. A deafening crack echoed through the clearing a gunshot. Pain roared through the creature, and it thrashed in surprise, the crushing weight upon me suddenly gone. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding against my ribs like a frantic bird against the cage. Another gunshot, then another. The creature let out a howl, a mix of pain and rage. I glimpsed two figures burst from the tree lean, rifles leveled. Jasper and Dalton, old hunting buddies. Relief washed over me in a dizzying wave, even as my vision blurred. The creature, wounded but still dangerous, turned its focus to the new threat. It charged, moving with terrifying speed despite its bulk. I stumbled back, my injured shoulder screaming in protest. Jasper fired, the bullet striking its flank, drawing a spray of inky blood. The creature stumbled slightly, but kept charging. Then Dalton fired, the shot echoed through the trees, followed by a sickening thud. The creature stumbled, its massive form crumpling to the ground. Jasper and Dalton approached cautiously, rifles still raised. Their faces were etched with a grim satisfaction mixed with a lingering tremor of fear. The creature was dead. It lay there, a silent, unmoving testimony to the night's horror. But even in death, its alien features stared back at us in grotesque relief. We stood there in the darkness the silence broken only by our ragged breathing, trying to reconcile logic with the impossible reality before us. I collapsed then, my battered body finally giving in. The pain in my shoulder flared anew, then vanished into the blissful darkness of unconsciousness. When I woke, it was in a hospital bed, the smell of antiseptic and white sheets a shocking contrast to the blood-soaked earth and the lingering stench of that creature. No one really believed our story. Accident report, they called it. A bear attack, maybe cougars got to me. The mangled bodies found in the clearing were blamed on wild animals. The creature itself, well, there was nothing left to prove or disprove what we'd seen. Dalton swore he buried the carcass, hid it someplace deep, said the world wasn't ready to know. Jasper nodded in grim agreement. I moved away from the Ozark shortly after. Got a desk job in the city, a boring routine that suited me just fine after that brush with death but the quiet of suburban life didn't stop the nightmares. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, the monstrous shape of that creature seared into my memory. The glowing eyes in the darkness still haunt me. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about what might have happened if Jasper and Dalton hadn't been out in those woods that night. Luck saved me, plain and simple but that knowledge doesn't ease the constant dread coiling deep in my gut. Something else survived out there, something dark and terrible, and the thought that it might be hunting still, that another innocent wanderer might stumble upon its bloody domain, it leaves me cold to the bone. Folks talk about Bigfoot sightings, whispers of strange creatures lurking in the forgotten corners of the world. And they're not all wrong. Sometimes, the campfire tales are warnings, echoes of truths that are just too monstrous to face in the harsh light of day. Now, when I walk down city streets, every shadowed alleyway, the space beneath a flickering streetlight, seems to harbor unseen shapes. I hear the crunch of dead leaves and smell the sharp tang of blood when it's just the rustle of wind and the metallic scent of rain on hot asphalt. At night, 
The siren's wail sets my pulse racing. The howl of the wind sounds like a distant, monstrous roar. My shoulder still throbs on rainy days, a phantom echo of the claws that nearly tore my life away. It's a constant reminder of the darkness that lurks beneath the surface of our familiar world, of the creatures that defy all understanding, that laugh in the face of reason. The Ozark Hills still call to me sometimes, whispering on the wind. I hear promises of quiet solitude and the familiar scent of pines. But I ignore it. The trees have secrets best left undisturbed, and some paths should never be ventured down twice. My name is Killian Maddox, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2014. I've lived out in these woods all my life a little cabin up in the Cascade foothills of Oregon. It's a quiet life, mostly. I do some trapping, some logging work when I can find it. Keeps me fed, keeps me busy. Back then I was running a line, checking muskrat traps along a creek swollen fat with fall rains. Deep in the woods, you find a campsite seemingly abandoned in a hurry. The tent is shredded, supplies scattered, and there are enormous, unidentifiable footprints pressed into the mud. Amidst the chaos, the air hangs heavy with a musky, animalistic smell you can't place. Now, odd things happen in the woods. Doesn't mean it's something supernatural. People panic, get lost, animals get into their supplies. But this, this was different. Those tracks, bigger than any bear I've ever seen, claws longer than my fingers. The way the tent was just ripped apart, not chewed. And that smell, sharp and metallic, with a tang underneath I couldn't place. My gut told me to turn back, but you don't survive out here by ignoring a mystery. I followed the tracks, rifle in hand. Senses on high alert. They vanished at the creek bank, the rushing water washing them away, like whatever left them didn't want to be followed. But further up, I found something else. A piece of torn blue nylon, snagged on a branch. It matched the shredded tent. That's when I heard it. A low, rumbling growl, from the far side of the creek. The hair stood up on my neck. I swung my rifle up, searching the tangled brush. Something flickered in the shadows, huge and dark. I strained my eyes, trying to make out a shape, but whatever it was, it shifted, blended into the thick greenery. It was watching me. I knew it. Now, I'm no fool. This was beyond anything I'd encountered. That growl, that presence, it wasn't just some oversized animal. My hand tightened on my rifle, debating. But something felt wrong about shooting at shadows. So I backed off slowly, keeping my eyes on the spot where I'd caught that flicker of movement. The rest of the day, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every rustle, every snap of a branch, set my heart pounding. That night, back at my cabin, I barely slept. My dreams were filled with those massive footprints and a pair of glowing eyes staring at me from the darkness. The next morning, I went back. Not to track whatever left those prints, but to clear my line. I couldn't afford to ignore my livelihood, even with the nagging fear in my gut. Besides, figuring something was dangerous was way different than running scared. The campsite looked the same, a wreck in the dappled light. I worked fast, my fingers clumsy with cold and a prickling unease. Halfway through, a sound stopped me dead. That same low growl, closer this time, from the direction of the tree lean. 
my heart hammered against my ribs. All right, come on out. I yelled, my voice rough. Show yourself. Silence. Just the whispering of the wind and the creak of branches. I knew then that it was playing with me, toying with its prey. I edged backward, rifle still raised, scanning the brush frantically for a sign. And then I saw it. Bursting from the undergrowth, a hulking shape, taller than any man, its fur dark and matted. Its eyes burned yellow, its mouth pulled back in a grotesque snarl revealing teeth the length of my hand. For a split second, we froze, the only sound my own ragged breathing. Then it let loose a blood-chilling roar and charged. I don't remember the details after that, just adrenaline and chaos. Firing my rifle, the shots echoing against the trees. The creature swerving, unbelievably fast for its size, the smell of hot fur and something foul stinging my nostrils. I stumbled, fell backward, the rifle flying from my grasp. It was on me, a crushing weight pinning me down, claws tearing at my clothes. I screamed, scrambling, more animal than human. I caught a glimpse of its face, not an ape, not a bear, but a twisted, vaguely human mockery. Its stench washed over me in a hot wave of rotten meat and something coppery and sweet. Through the blur, I found my hunting knife, drove it blindly into its flank. It howled, rearing back, a spray of inky blood arcing across the leaves. That one desperate strike bought me precious seconds. I scrambled to my feet, my heart a frantic drumbeat against my ribs. The creature circled, wounded but far from defeated. Its yellow eyes narrowed, flecks of my blood spattering its muzzle. Behind it, I spotted my rifle lying in the mud. A mad dash, a prayer, and I scooped it up. The creature lunged even as I brought the gun to bear. My shot tore through the air, deafening in the forest silence. The creature stumbled, one massive paw clutching at its shoulder, a dark stain blooming on its fur. It let out another enraged bellow, and then, it ran. Not in panic, not in a rout, but a strategic retreat. I stood there, chest heaving, not daring to believe my eyes. It was immense, powerful, a creature straight out of nightmares, and I'd wounded it. But instead of pressing its attack, it chose to flee deeper into the tangled wilderness. A primal surge of triumph coursed through me, quickly doused by a chilling wave of reality. Whatever that thing was, it was still out there, hurt, and that made it infinitely more dangerous. My hands shook as I reloaded, the smell of gunpowder mingling with the creature's foul musk. I had to get out of there, warn someone. It could tear apart a deer, it could tear apart a man, and maybe it had already done just that to those campers. My remaining traps were forgotten. I bolted back toward the trail, my legs burning, my mind racing. Every rustle of undergrowth made me jump, the snap of each twig setting off a chain of panicked heartbeats. When I finally burst from the tree lean and saw my truck parked on the logging road, a ragged sob escaped me. I reported everything to the sheriff. They organized a search party, but I knew, deep down, they'd find nothing. That creature was too smart, too cunning for a bunch of men poking around in the underbrush. They humored me, the old hermit who lived in the hills. Wrote it off as a bear encounter, maybe a drug-fueled hallucination. I became the local crazy, my warnings dismissed as the ramblings of a wild-eyed loner. But I knew what I saw. The memory burned vivid as acid. Those footprints, 
that hulking shape, the rank smell, those eyes glowing with a hunger I couldn't comprehend. Sometimes, late at night, I still hear that guttural roar echoing in my skull. I sold the cabin shortly after. Too many bad memories, too many shadows moving just out of sight. Moved to a small town at the edge of the wilderness, took up work at a lumber mill. It ain't the life I wanted, but it's a life. Nights are easier here, fewer sounds creeping out of the dark. But the woods, they still call to me sometimes. I know what waits within their depths, what might lurk just beyond the next shadowed bend. The years passed in a blur of sawdust and uneasy nights. My story faded locally, a creepy tale to be whispered on hunting trips. Then, on the news, reports started filtering in. Hikers vanished in those same mountains, disappearances the authorities couldn't explain. Sightings of a massive creature near remote logging camps, whispers of mutilated deer carcasses stripped to the bone. They never connected it to me, the mad hermit with his wild story. But each report chipped away at the fragile piece I'd built. My old nightmares returned, the phantom echoes of those snapping branches drawing closer, punctuated by that haunting, blood-curdling roar. And then, last month, they found her. A local reporter, gutsy enough to go digging where others feared to tread. She'd been researching those disappearances, piecing together the fragments of stories. She vanished two weeks back. They just recovered her body out in the woods. Torn apart, they said. They're calling it a freak animal attack, but I saw the photos leaked online. Those wounds, they matched the ragged gashes I'd left in that monstrous hide all those years ago. It's learned, adapted, become bolder. And the worst part, the part that chills my blood, is there was something almost methodical in the carnage, a gruesome message scrawled in tattered flesh. It knows I'm out here. I don't sleep much anymore. I keep a loaded shotgun by my bed and check the locks twice before turning in. I know, sooner or later, it'll find me. Maybe it's revenge, maybe it just sees me as unfinished business doesn't matter in the end. One night, it'll come for me. The creak on the stairs won't be floorboards settling. The wind in the treetops won't just be the breeze. There'll be a growl outside the window, deep and rumbling, followed by the sharp scent of blood and rot on the air. And when those burning yellow eyes peer at me through the darkness, it won't be the first time we meet. My name's Rowan Ellison, and this happened to me back in 2010. I spent most of my adult life working for the Forest Service up in Alaska. It's rugged territory, mountains, glaciers, and vast stretches of wilderness where nature holds all the cards. Makes you feel like an ant dropped into a snow globe. One crisp September morning, out on patrol, I came across a campsite in utter chaos. Looked like a tornado went through it, tent ripped to shreds, food containers scattered like confetti, and a pair of half-eaten hiking boots abandoned in the mud. All that was missing was a body, but the lingering animalistic stench gave me a clear indication of what kind of predator likely made this its trophy pile. Problem was, those footprints, Massive paw prints etched into the muddy riverbank, they didn't match any animal I knew. Too big for a bear, wrong shape for a moose, and there are no wolves or big cats that size up in Alaska. Yet, that same monstrous print trailed away towards the treeline, fading as the ground hardened again. I radioed it in, the usual protocol, and that's when the laughter started. 
Chuck, a grizzled old-timer on the other end of the line, figured I'd been sampling too much moonshine up in my isolated outpost and was seeing Bigfoot. The rest of the guys on the radio joined in, ribbing the greenhorn whose mind was playing tricks on him. But deep down, a primal sense of unease had taken root. Being alone in those woods after that changed things. Every rustling leaf became a stalking predator, every broken twig evidence of a monstrous visitor. Nights became the worst. The Alaskan wilderness takes on a different character under starlight, the shadows shifting and alive with unseen movement. I found myself barricaded inside my ranger cabin, heart pounding, shotgun loaded. One night, unable to bear the tension any longer, I ventured out onto the porch, a flashlight my feeble attempt to conquer the darkness. That's when I saw it. Crouched on a distant rise, silhouetted against the cold Alaskan stars, was a creature that sent a surge of icy terror through me. It was immense, easily twice the size of a bear, its long limbs moving with unsettling grace. Its fur was almost black, and its head was large, elongated into a muzzle full of gleaming teeth. But the worst thing was its eyes. They burned with a chilling yellow light that felt intelligent, calculating. The next two years are a blur of patrols, whispers echoing in the wind, and what I now call shadow sightings. Those fleeting glimpses of a massive creature that defied any attempt at identification haunted my footsteps. It felt like a sick game of cat and mouse, where the rules were rigged and I always had a target on my back. Then, one rainy autumn evening, whispers reached me of other ravaged campsites near a remote lake and reports of missing hikers in the surrounding mountains. The chilling familiarity set alarm bells ringing, and I knew it was too late to warn them. I gathered my gear, radioed my resignation, and headed out, determined to at least find proof, even at the cost of my own sanity. The trail to the lake was long and treacherous. With each step, an echo of past tragedies seemed to seep from the moss-covered trees. The stench of decay grew stronger as I neared the lake, and that's when I found them. Two bodies, or rather, what remained of them, lay exposed to the elements. Bones picked clean, tattered clothes strewn like bloody confetti, a horrifying testament to the creature's hunger. Grief and rage warred within me. I forced myself to document everything to collect every torn piece of clothing, every grisly remnant, anything that would force the world to finally acknowledge the horror lurking in the untamed heart of the Alaskan wilderness. It took me two days to hike back to civilization. The faces of the rangers who met me at my truck were a mixture of pity and shock as I thrust my gruesome evidence at them. Expectedly, my proof was dismissed as a hoax my story attributed to PTSD induced by the loneliness of the Alaskan wilds. In the end, they offered early retirement and a psych evaluation. I took both and left that life behind, yet to this day, I carry those Alaskan woods with me wherever I go. I found odd jobs in the lower states, the anonymity of cities a poor substitute for the stark freedom of the wilderness but there are some ghosts you can never truly escape. I still bolt awake in a cold sweat, hearing the guttural growl and smelling that rotten stench that heralds the creature's presence. I hear its heavy footfalls on the city street, see its yellow eyes peering out from behind parked cars. And as I drift off into a fitful sleep, there's always that same, bone-chilling certainty, it's still out there biding its time in the forgotten shadows of the wild. And the worst part is, I know, deep down, it hasn't forgotten about me either. Perhaps one day, the hunters and the hunted will change roles, 
and I'll head back north with a worn rifle in hand. Rowan's words clung to the smoky air of the dive bar, leaving the room heavy with unresolved tension. The old biker across from him, a man more leather than flesh, finished his beer and grunted. You want payback, son, I ain't gonna stop you. But that Alaska madness will eat you alive if you ain't careful. The years hadn't dimmed the fire in Rowan's eyes. Careful don't bring back the dead, old man. This ain't about careful. He tossed back a shot, the burn a welcome distraction. This is about finishing it. Preparation became an obsession. Hunting forums, old wives' tales, and even Native American lore on the Kushtaka, some spoke of a shape-shifting otter spirit that lured men to their deaths. Whatever the truth, Rowan trained like his life depended on it. Because it did. With his pack heavier and his resolve steelier, he returned to the scarred wilderness of his nightmares. The scent of wet earth and pine filled him with grim familiarity, the creature's domain finally stretched out before him. Days turned into weeks, each step a test of his determination. The absence of tracks, of any tangible sign of the monster, fueled Rowan's doubts, a gnawing thought at the edge of his mind, was it real, or just madness in the Alaskan wilds? One moonlit night, he made camp near the lake of tragedy. Sleep refused to come, his senses on fire. Suddenly, the chilling sound he'd learned to dread tore through the silence, a guttural growl, deeper than any earthly animal. He froze, rifle train on the treeline. Then, there it was. The sheer size of the creature as it stepped into the moonlight dwarfed Rowan's worst nightmares. Muscle rippled beneath its jet-black fur, claws the size of daggers gleaming wickedly. Its yellow eyes held a terrible, burning intelligence. Rowan fired. The creature shrieked, not in pain, but in fury. The impact sent it stumbling back, yet the monster didn't fall. A second shot echoed, then a third, driving it deeper into the shadows. Rowan pursued, the bloodlust finally overcoming his terror. His shots had found their mark, a trail of thick, unnatural-smelling blood marked the creature's retreat. He stalked on until sunrise, the blood trail growing thinner and finally vanishing into a thicket too dense to penetrate. Exhaustion swept over him, mingled with a bitter sense of defeat. He'd wounded the beast, but not enough. It would heal, it would remember, and it would be back. Some battles, Rowan realized, were fought over lifetimes. The return to civilization proved even harder than leaving it. He arrived back at his doorstep a haunted shell of the man he once was. The media, alerted to a bear attack survivor, descended like vultures, their cameras and microphones blind to the true horror clawing at his insides. The story of his final encounter, distorted and ridiculed, turned Rowan into a punchline, the Alaskan ranger with monster fever plastered on tabloids next to blurry Bigfoot photos. It broke the last fragments of the normal life he yearned for. And so, true tragedy came not in the form of claws or fangs. Instead, Rowan found himself lost in a new wilderness, one of scorn and disbelief. The creature stalked his dreams, of course. But now, even in waking hours, he was prey of a different sort. He retreated, further and further into isolation, a recluse in a crowded world. The man who'd faced the monster of the wild succumbed to the monsters within the minds of his fellow humans. News reports years later would mention the mysterious disappearance of an ex-forest ranger with only cryptic ramblings found written on the walls of his cabin. 
Some whispered about mental collapse, others about a return to the Alaskan wilds for one last showdown. But in those quiet, wild places where the stars reflect coldly on still lakes, some say that if you listen closely, you can still hear a chilling growl echo through the night, a testament to the battle that wages on in the forever wild places of the earth, and within men's hearts. My name's Ethan Powell, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2019. I work for the U.S. Forest Service on the Oregon coast, mostly forest health surveys in the Tillamook State Forest. It's rugged country, old-growth giants, and tangled undergrowth, the kind of place where you can get turned around real quick if you don't pay attention. One afternoon, I was deep in the woods marking off a survey plot, when I came across a campsite. Or, what was left of one. The tent was a shredded mess, ripped apart like a wild animal had gotten to it. Supplies were scattered everywhere, torn clothing, empty food containers, some busted up camping gear. No blood, no bodies, just this abandoned wreck. But the prince, Oh man, the prints. They were massive, bigger than any bear tracks I'd ever seen. The claws were at least five inches long and the pads wider than my hand. There were no drag marks, no struggle signs, just this sudden scene of chaos. I took photos and sent them back to base camp. Dispatch was skeptical, said it was probably a prank or some kids got into an animal carcass. But they said they'd let folks up the chain of command know, better safe than sorry. For the rest of that day, I found myself double-checking over my shoulder, every snap of a twig making me jump. I didn't like the feeling, being out here alone when something that powerful was lurking out there, something unknown. That night, lying in my sleeping bag in my own little tent, I dreamt of those clawed footprints pressing into the wet ground. Next morning, I got instructions to stay put, flag down a ranger patrol if I saw one, but not to venture off on my own. I waited. Hours passed. Finally, I saw a truck bouncing up the logging road. Two rangers hopped out. Jim and Sarah, both seasoned vets who I knew from my time at base camp. They listened to my story, looked at the photos, and then fanned out to examine the campsite. Jim called it in, requesting a wider search party and a specialist to come out and take a closer look. That afternoon, a guy named Warren showed up. Game warden from down south apparently one of those tracker types the agencies bring in on strange cases. He had a weathered face, squinty eyes, and carried a long-barreled rifle. He circled the campsite, staring at the ground like he was reading a book. Then he crouched by those massive prints, muttering to himself. That's when things got really weird. Warren stood up, looking grim. Ain't no animal I ever seen, he declared, his voice gruff. If we find the people from this camp, they'll be in pieces. I remember Sarah going pale, and Jim exchanging a worried glance with me. We weren't dealing with some rogue bear or a lost hiker situation anymore. This felt different, dangerous. Warren was leading the new search party. He took point. Jim and Sarah brought up the rear, and I was sandwiched awkwardly in the middle. I don't think any of us liked the arrangement. We found the first body an hour later. Well, what was left of him? A man, middle-aged, up in a tree, torso torn open like a grizzly had gotten hold of him. There was blood spatter high on the branches, but no sign of a struggle beneath the tree like whatever got him had just reached up and plucked him out of the air. 
someone puked off to the side. It wasn't me, but I came close. Warren was ice cold, carefully examining the body while the rest of us tried to keep it together. This is fresh, he said. This thing, whatever it is, is still close. We kept going, the air thick with tension. I'd grip my rifle, then loosen my fingers, my hands sweating. We found bits and pieces of the other victim along the way. A boot with a foot still in it, a tattered jacket snagged on a branch. Warren tracked the trail, following spots of blood, broken foliage, and those damn footprints. It was getting close to dusk when he stopped abruptly, raising a fist to halt our progress. He crouched, pointing at a depression in the soft ground ahead. We crowded behind him, our breaths coming in ragged gasps. There was a body, or at least mostly one. A woman, young. She was face down, one arm twisted behind her at an unnatural angle but it was her legs, or rather, what was left of them. They ended in ragged stumps just above the knees. From the waist up, she looked untouched. Sarah swore and turned away, and I felt a surge of bile rise in my own throat. Warren didn't even blink. He got on his radio, his voice low and urgent, requesting immediate backup and a helicopter for evacuation. The shadows were getting longer, the forest closing in around us as the light dimmed. I don't remember much about the wait for backup. It was a blur of adrenaline, nausea, and the growing dread that whatever we were dealing with was still out there, watching us. I tried to piece together what could do this. What kind of creature that leaves footprints like that, and snatches people out of trees? My rational mind kept failing me. Help arrived just as darkness fell, floodlights, more rangers, someone from fish and wildlife. They secured the area, started taking our statements. I noticed Warren was nowhere to be found. They found his rifle abandoned a bit down the trail the stock busted as if it had been used as a club. But there was no blood, no sign of Warren, just his gear and a set of those huge footprints disappearing into the thick underbrush. The helicopters whirred in the distance, bathing the forest with harsh white light. Relief washed over me, an exhaustion so heavy I could barely stand. But something felt unfinished, a loose thread dangling. I looked around frantically, expecting Warren to emerge from the shadows, unharmed and stoic, with an explanation none of us were ready to hear. But the forest remained silent. The rest of that night was a blur. Questioning by agents I didn't know, flashes of the scene playing over and over in my mind. I was sent home on leave a mandatory psych evaluation looming over me like a dark storm cloud. The official narrative was a bear or cougar attack, maybe even a pair working together. It sounded ludicrous to me, but to them, it fit better than the other possibility, the one that whispered in the back of my head. They never found Warren. No body, no blood, nothing but that abandoned rifle. Sometimes, I'd swear I'd see him out of the corner of my eye, a tall, weathered figure moving through the trees. Folks called him the woodsman who vanished, a ghost story whispered around campfires in the Tillamook. The Forest Service offered me relocation, a desk job in some far-off city office. I almost took it. But something nagged at me, a sense of unfinished business. I stayed in Oregon, on the coast, but out of the deep woods. I work with a coastal conservation group these days, beach surveys, and wetland monitoring. Nothing too adventurous. Yet, even now, 
the sea doesn't feel as vast as those woods did. Even on a crowded beach, I sometimes get that feeling I did that first day, of being watched. I'll skin a tree lean along the sand dunes, half expecting to see those massive footprints in the wet sand. I've looked up everything I can on cryptozoology, Bigfoot sightings, unexplained deaths in national forests. Nothing quite matches up, which almost feels worse. That day left me with questions I fear I won't ever answer. The other night, I had the dream again. The clawed footprints, the dark shape at the edge of the light, and a low rumbling sound that I couldn't quite call a growl. But in the dream, there was something else. A sense of age, of an intelligence that was both utterly primal and chillingly aware. I woke up in a cold sweat, the forest pressing in from the shadows of my bedroom. I guess some stories don't really end. Some wounds stay with you, lingering reminders that out there, in the wild places, there are things we were never meant to understand.